Welcome to the town of Dines and now the traditional home for the start of Ghent Wavelgem, which is the second of the early spring classics here in Belgium. We saw Tom Bone on winning Flanders. The big question is now, can he repeat his victory of here one year ago when he took out this race as well? He'll certainly go out favoured, but watch out for the men who will challenge him, like another winner of this event, Andreas Kleyer. And let's not forget either George Hincapi, who also won this event a few years ago. What a contrast to the weather of just four days ago. The Tour of Flanders run off in beautiful spring-like conditions. Today it is windy and rather chilly. It's a perfect day for Ghent Wavelgum. Let's join Paul Shoei now talking to the riders. Weet je wat wij gaan doen? We gaan een minuut lawaai maken voor Tom Bonen. Heb je het? Just a couple of quick questions because I know you've got to get to the stop. What a fantastic way to win the Tour of Flanders alone. That's uh, the best way to win it. Eh? I think uh, a monument like uh, Tour of Flanders. It's such a hard race. Um, I think for me the only way to win it is uh, get there alone. Now there might be a little bit of pressure on you because it was 1962 when Rick Van Looy won Tour of Flanders, Ghent Wevelgem and Paris-Roubaix. Are you thinking about that? And I already won Heidelberg, eh? so uh, maybe I can do it for her. <laughs> the, the pressure of the team must be on you, but do you think really it's, it's a lot or are you a little bit more relaxed now that you have Flanders under the belt? No, we're more relaxed now. Um, we have the one big classic we were aiming for and uh, it was a few years ago. And now um, I think we have the advantage of having uh, the, the strongest team, having uh, the advantage to possibility to wait and uh, that will be important for next Sunday. Well, good luck today. Thank you. I've got to say, I always get a buzz looking at you in the British National Champions jersey. Yeah, it feels good actually. It's nice to ride the classics in a National Champions jersey and luckily enough I've had two years of doing it, so um, it's good. It brings an extra bit of interest to all the races and yeah, uh, gives you an extra bit of motivation, you know. You feel a bit more proud with the jersey you're wearing and when it's hard it gives you a little bit more motivation, so it can't be a bad thing. Just talking to George Hincapie about the fact that uh, he's a previous winner here and he said, yeah, watch out for Roger Hammond because he's been in the top ten a couple of times. Yeah, it's, it's been my, it's been, it was my original, you know, first breakthrough as a race actually. It's the first time I've gone in the first ten in a classic, so um, it's a bit of a special race for me. And I used to live about a K and a half from the finish line when I first, when I first turned up in Belgium, so, you know, it's the first real finish line of a big race that I ever saw, so yeah, it's, it's a little bit special for me, so I'm, uh, I have a little bit extra motivation. Big week for you and for George Hincapie. Yeah, that's it, but you know, um, Sunday and everything's finished, so we've got to get everything out by Sunday, so it's a big week, there's a lot of pressure, but you know, um, it's what we, what we like doing, so you know, if you enjoy doing it, it's always easy to do. OK, cheers, thanks. Tom, it's great to see you here at the start again, Wave Game. This has always been regarded as a sprinter's race. With the Tricolor jersey on your shoulders, a bit of motivation. Yeah, it is, huh? We're going to see how it goes. It's, uh, today is a bit different with the wind. It's, uh, it's the opposite like we used to do, so uh, it's going to be a funny race, I think, but still, it's a very nice race to win. Huh? It was interesting to know in the newspapers this morning, you said, well, Tom Bonin's like any other man, he just has two legs. Yeah, it is. Huh? Uh, they are very strong legs, but they're still two legs, so uh, it's also a different race. I said if you have to sprint against him in the Tour of Flanders, I'm beaten, but in a race like this, I think uh, we have a chance. Huh? It's nice to see you coming back into the sport, because for a couple of years it looked as if you were going to have to retire, and you've come back in right at the top. Yeah, we, we, had, to, we had to take our time for two years, now, now I feel that I'm back. Uh, back strong and, and, and especially fast in the sprint, so it's, it's, it's good for me. And a special motivation for today's race? Yeah, I, uh, it's the first time in three or four years I feel I have the relax again to win it, so let's hope it goes well. The post from the It's pleasant that Tom. It's great to see you riding this race and uh, it's also important to see you riding alongside the young Tom Bonham because uh, it seems to be that whenever there's a, a moment of worry you're near him. Yeah, I think it's uh, important uh, to have a good team and uh, 
Yeah, I'm 30, uh, 34 years old now, so I have uh, a lot of experience. So I think that's uh, getting more important uh, for a rider like me. And so I can help uh, Tom and the team uh, wherever they need me. A lot of people might have thought with the retirement of Johan Museo from the sport, Belgium would, would need to find somebody else. And already they're looking to Tom Bonin as the new lion. Yeah, he's uh, doing uh, great things. And uh, if you can win uh, Tour of Flanders at 24, years old uh, I think uh, he doesn't need to tell uh, tell more to uh, to explain how good he is having won the Tour of Flanders the team seems nice and relaxed now going through to today's game wherever game and Paris Roubaix yeah it's relaxed but still we are nervous for today uh, today's a new race and uh, we're very motivated to uh, to win again today good luck we better get down to the start yeah it's, that's most important to, to get it <laughs> okay well, Alan, a great start to the season, uh, but this race here again, Wevel game, is the sort of race that should suit you. Yeah, it's going to be my first time racing here. Uh, looking at the, the profile and the past results from previous years, yeah, hopefully it goes well. It's always been regarded as a sprinter's race, but the difficult thing for the sprinters is you've got to get over to Kemmelberg a couple of times. <laughs> That's the thing. That's the thing. Uh, and uh, position before the, the Kemmelberg as well is going to be uh, you know, a big part of the race. And yeah, hopefully can get in the front and have a few teammates around me as well. And uh, we'll see what happens at the end. Have you been over to Camelberg before? Yeah, uh, not the way of the race, but we, we did three days of pun the other day and in the stage we went over it, so uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Nasty little climb, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, very nasty. I'm oh, lucky my, one of my roommates is a Dutch guy called the court, so he's been telling me all about the roads. So it's a, you know, when you're not, you don't know the roads, it's handy to have someone like that. Okay, good luck. Thanks, mate. Inderdaad, de minister-president heeft er nog geen meen gemist in Deinze. Andrea, Tour of Flanders was not so great for you, but this weekend Paris-Roubaix is a special day for you. Yes, it's really. It's, uh, for me, one week more more important. And uh, Sunday also too much important for me. And, uh, I try to go very fast, but I uh, you know many, many people go Nico, fast, uh, also yeah. all Nico. team uh, Discovery Channel and uh, Quick Step uh, and also, I see. But this important for me is a special day. Nico, Nico. Andre, is it really possible that you're going to retire? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I see after the race. Yeah, okay. Ik hoorde Nico. Hi, hi. Ja. Vroeg uit koers. Die zet alles op geen twee voor hem. Hang. What? Why does everybody live in Brakel? Good. You come feel it. Wow, it's the epicenter of Flemish cycling, and you know you got all the climbs, and there's a lot of teammates there, and. Uh, it's just great, great training. Special race for you this Gent Wevel game, isn't it? Because a couple of years ago, that close to the win. Yeah, that close. Uh, yeah, second place, first loser, but it was a good, good uh, prestation for me. And I mean, and, you know, hopefully with a better team this year, uh, something can change. But we've got Tom Steele's in the team this year, and he's starting to come up. So, and hopefully Boone is a little tired from Sunday. So, you know, hopefully I could be there for the for the sprinting role. But you still got to get over the Kemmelberg, and that's you know the race. Oh, good luck. No worries, mate. Ben je nu als je hier voor die eigen volk staat en straks mag starten nerveuzer dan gewoon. Nice jersey, mate. Tour of Flanders was a bit hard, wasn't it? Oh, I don't know. I watched it on TV. No, uh, Matt Wilson and I were both sick with a virus, so we just rode the first feed, then got off and went and watched it on the hotel TV. Are you feeling a little bit better because, in theory, this is your kind of race? Oh, I feel 100% better today. Yesterday was the first day I felt normal, and uh, today I feel really good. And, uh, I'm hoping, you know, being a race that suits me really well, we can really pull off a result here today. As a sprinter, you must be a little bit motivated by this event. Oh, more than a little bit motivated. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> All right, see ya. Maggie, just tell me, what was, what was the deal on Sunday? Why were you in a breakaway so far from the finish in a race that you can win? Um, well, it was, I wasn't supposed to go in a break. Um, I saw a group go and I thought I'll, I'll just jump in there and uh, hopefully grab, you know, we'll make a big group out of it. And 
I turned around and there was only five, six of us, and that was yeah, it. Like, you know. But then again, it was a good training ride for Maybe for next Sunday and a bit of a test to see how how the legs were doing. And uh, I felt good. So that's what we thought. You looked very good. You looked very comfortable on the cobblestones. But as you rode over those cobblestones, you must have known not much chance of winning here. But next week. Yeah, that's exactly what I had in mind. I wanted to to try a bit and to see how the what kind of sensation I had on the cobblestones and I was able to find that sort of floating feeling you know you're sort of just touching the tops of the stones and that's exactly how I want it for next Sunday. Your other mate is also riding pretty well I noticed Roger Hammond. Yeah he's going really well he's done a strong year again and uh, you know he's just going from strength to strength and you know hopefully they'll leave him to do, to do a little bit of his own ride on Sunday because I think he can really do something up there. What's the word in the peloton about the ride of Tom Boonen? The word, I mean, the guy's unbelievable. He he sprints like, like no one move, else. He's, no, he's move, so no. strong that you can't ride him off the wheels. So whatever he does, he's got he's got the advantage of pretty much everyone at the moment. So absolutely incredible talent on the bike. Birth of a new star. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Georgie, when you come to the start of a race that you won before, the morale must be just slightly different. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually always high racing in Belgium. It's uh, a great country to race in, and there's so many fans out here. Uh, I just hope that my legs are good. I've been feeling great since uh, Flanders. I haven't been tired, and I feel much better than I did last week, so I hope for the best for today and Sunday. I have to say, watching you ride up the Mur de Grammont at the end of the Tour of Flanders on Sunday, you actually look very comfortable. Yeah, no, I, I had good legs on Sunday. Um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't sure of my fitness just because I would have been sick before that, but I'm, I'm happy with the way I was at the end. I wasn't happy with the result, but I was happy with the way that my legs felt and the way I was riding uh, at, the, at the finish of the race. I still had power left, so that's a good sign for today and for Sunday. What about a man like Stein de Valde, your teammate? Uh, a little bit unknown in races like this, but he's got a good chance of taking the pressure off you. Yeah, Stein and Life and Roger. You know, Roger's been in the top 10 here several years now, and uh, so we have a lot of options to play today, and we hope to have a two, three, four guys in the final move there. Just one final question about Tom Bonham, because that was a very impressive ride. For a young man who's only 24 years of age, were you surprised? Yeah, definitely a super ride, what he did, and he didn't wait till the end, he attacked those guys and he was on uh, an amazing okay, day and uh, very impressive Tom Stales. okay good luck today thanks well Stein it's a uh, game Wevel game this morning the team rode fairly well in the Tour of Flanders but I wonder if Johan Brunel was a little bit upset that George Hincapie missed a big move yeah actually we were all uh, upset after, after Sunday because uh, George, George was uh, was very good but uh, we were surprised uh, from the attack on the on the Valkenberg and uh, after then we, we tried to to close the gap but, uh, but uh, the strongest guys were in, uh, were in front so it was uh, impossible. Today's a chance to make amends and maybe get a victory here in Gang Wevel game. It's a race that George Hincap has won before. Yeah, George is in uh, very good condition right now, so uh, we try uh, to do something, especially today and, and also Sunday in Paris de Bay. But Stein de Volder is also in pretty good condition because just recently he won the three days of La Pana. And a win by you today could take the pressure off the team. Yeah, we, we try, but uh, yeah, we see. Uh, it would be nice, but uh, uh, difficult in, in races like this. Okay, well, good luck. Well, Eric, a lot of people are putting you down as a big favourite today, and maybe because of the way you rode uh, at the weekend in Tour of Flanders. Yeah, I have, I have a good day uh, last Sunday in Flanders, and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, it was echt uh, echt fun. It was good to see you riding in a, a slightly different style because normally a sprinter holds back, but you were attacking all the time. Yeah, normally I, I'm sitting uh, under pressure because I'm the head of the team in uh, some races. But uh, last Sunday we have uh, this Wesemann, uh, uh, last year's winner and a big favorite, and this Andreas Clear also. Uh, so I have a free role and uh, I want to help these guys a li little bit. But today, Game Wevel game is much more of a race suited to Eric Zabel, and especially with a little bit of wind and just a few climbs towards the end. Yeah, uh, I was uh, a lot of times here, 
and mostly uh, I, I was uh, in the best 10, so today I try better. Let's hope there's no horses. Let's hope there's no horses. <laughs> and no dogs and whatever. <laughs> Thanks. Here's some previous winners for you here. Bonin, the last winner, might be ominous. Andreas Clear running him close in two big events this year. Uh, winning this event in 2003. George Hincapie, the winner there in 2001. The record, by the way, is three victories by four men. And uh, only Tom Steeles can equal that with victory today. And the course, very, very traditional one here, starting these days in Dinza, then racing out uh, towards the coast through the hometown, the Gistel of Johan Museu, swinging back in from Ostend, heading towards the big target of the day, which is the Kemmelberg, and they go round the Kemmelberg loop twice before making their way back to Wavelgum, and they'll finish with a very strong tailwind today, and there's the flags to prove it. I hope they've chosen the right gears, Paul. I certainly hope they have, and uh, we already know that uh, there's a lot of riders here on the start line, and you can see, in fact, there's a massive crowd turning out here in Dainza. And a little bit of a chat here with Nico Matin, who's drink drinking here some Geneva, which is a very strong alcoholic drink <laughs> from the region. Third in Depana not long ago. Well, there's a brave man to have that. This is Jimmy Casper of Cofidis. One win so far and looking as though he's got some good form. He might have to uh, think about his teammate here this afternoon because uh, I have a funny feeling Stuart O'Grady will be looking for the win. Seems pretty relaxed before the start. <laughs> well, as they talk to Stuart, this is Sergei Ivanov here, the former twice Russian champion. And uh, just alongside him, peeping in the picture, is Andreas Clear. And this is one Antonio Fletcher, the Fasa Bortolo Spanish rider, who's turning out to be a very good one day classics man. Thomas Voigler, the Boiger, Boiger Telecom team of France, the champion of France, made his name, of course, last year in the Tour de France. And Ludovic Capel, national champion in 2001, needs a result, really, to get himself back into the world of big-time pro racing. Andrea Taffy, well, the big time's passed him now. Oh, dear, he's talking to me, Paul. Well, Taffy talking about retiring. I wonder if he will retire at the end of uh, Paris-Roubaix as he's... Uh, predicted for the last year or so i hope not because what a character that man is just in the background in the blue and white jerseys team barlow world the south african squad they'll be looking to perform well in a race like this watch out for this man today alessandro balan rode a great tour de flanders finished sixth and is threatening to be the big newcomer here this season ludo dierksons 40 years of age and still gets the best cheer of the day And Stephen de Jong of Rabobank, he won Kuna Brussels Kuna last year and uh, could come up with the goods given the right move. He has a good team around him, Tor Hushoft from the Credit Agricole squad, champion of Norway. He's also a man placed high in the overall standings of the uh, new Pro Tour. A win today could put him right up towards the top. And Maggie Backstead, after a very good ride in the Tour of Flanders, looking very comfortable. Uh, Georgie Hincapie. Won this race a couple of years ago and talking here to his teammate, Max van Heeswijk, who's also a likely candidate, but I think in the race today to help George. <coughs> Jan Kersipu, the big sprinter, third last year, and still looking for that one big classic victory that would really put the icing on the top of the cake for him. Bernard Eisel, Francaise des Jeux, good sprinter from Austria. And the champion of Belgium, Tom Steeles. He's posing with Miss Belgium Beauty 2005 here. He won the race in 96-99. One more win. Puts him up alongside Rick Van Looy, Eddie Merckx, Mario Cipollini. So Vladimir Gusev, a long-time leader of Paris-Nice, uh, the prologue, I should say, anyway. And uh, this is a very good local hero, Gorek Gardain, for MrBookmaker.com. Of Russian descent, but now of Belgian nationality. Frankie Hoy of Gerolsteiner, coming towards the end of his career now, but still capable of a big result. And the quick step boys of Kevin Holtzmans and Tom Bonan getting the big cheers of the crowd here. He really has accelerated to the top of the pile of the most popular cyclists in Belgium after Sunday's win on his own in the Tour of Flanders. 
And you know, if he wins this race and next Sunday's Paris Bay, the only the man to have done that is Rick Van Loy. There goes the gun, and that's the Flemish minister, President Yves Le Terme, sending them on their way. 208 kilometers. And the weather, well, rain is threatened, but with a bit of luck, it might stay away. Now that climb you can see in the distance is a climb by the name of the Vidayenberg. Well, I always knew it as the Zwarteberg or the Black Mountain. They climb right up through there through the trees. Then over the top there, that is the, the Rodeberg or the Red Mountain. They drop off the summit of the Red Mountain, then go down to the Monteberg. So quite a bit of climbing to come in the next 10 kilometers. And they know it. Here's the change of direction now for the race as we swing towards the Dienberg. And this is the breakaway group with Carsten Kroon now dropping back. Now the cars have arrived, of course. Everybody wants to get drinks on board. They know what's just up the road and they don't want to leave it too long. Bernati now of Lamprey wants his car to come and join him. Hushoft has gone back into the pack there. And the other rider just ahead there, number 53, that is Nico Ikut, who's on terrific form, Nico. He's had two very good wins already this year. Seems to be, he is a man for Belgium. We don't talk about him much in international races. He doesn't ride the big races really, but he loves his racing in Belgium. Could deliver a good result here. It wouldn't surprise us in the least. Stefan Addison there from Sweden, another new man on the block and leading the Barlow World Team today, which although uh, it's registered in Great Britain, it basically is a South African setup. And uh, those boys are going places. Adamson. Uh, unleashing his, uh, his temper here panicking. on the team. Where think, are they? I think panicking just a fraction here. And look at that. Uh, well, I don't think uh, that's uh, good news for Discovery Channel. Georgie Hinkapi obgeheve, which means George Hinkapi has just abandoned a few moments ago, and I'm sure he knows the writing is on the wall, and I think we're probably looking at the victor here, Phil, of Game Wavel Game coming from this very large sprint. There's they're another all, man pulling out. They're all going because they know this breakaway, I think, has gone. And uh, as they head towards the Kemmel first time, then as so often happens in this race, if you miss the move, you leave it, you take a shortcut, and we'll probably see them come past our commentary position in the next hour or so. On to the cobblestones now, Vestuta. Just a short little stretch to warm the old legs up. They're over and done with, you see, as Magnus Baxter brings them through here. Then surveys Canavan, looks over for a little bit of help now from Credit Agricole. Uh, this uh, could well be, by the end of the day, the only group that completes the full circuit now. Could very well be, because uh, there are two laps to do around this circuit. And uh, at the front there, you just saw Magnus Baxter. This is where the climb starts to kick up. It's actually quite a nasty climb here, because it starts at a very steady pace, and it kicks up just a fraction towards the end. And then there's a nasty little left-hand turn to take the riders up to the top of the Mont Rouge or the Rodeberg. Having a quick look into the team car there. This uh, at the back end of the group you can see is uh, one of the riders from uh, Lotto. This is Gert Stegemans talking to the team manager. And they must be very happy with the presence of Tom Steeles in this group. And maybe a little sad by the absence of Robbie McEwen, who started the season off so well but has been dogged by a very nasty bronchial infection as is often the case when you come from a hot country where he was riding well back home in Australia to the cold and damp air of Belgium. There's Matty Hayman, another Australian on the far left. As Canavan goes through, Tom Bonin, here comes Canavan, sorry, that, and there's Kretzkens just behind, Holtzman's just behind him. That was Kretzkens in the lead. That's Cook. Baden right. Cook, the Aussie's doing well today, packing the front. Cook needs a result, really, to get himself back on track. But Lotto need a result, too, and they've got three men here, Steels, Vogels and Stegmans, and they are the quality for this type of race. They certainly are. You can see now that this climb is just starting to kick up a fraction. We're looking here at the, the figure of Fabian Cancellara, who's riding fairly well. They've got two good riders in this group here, Fasa Bortolo, because not only Cancellara is in the group, but they've also got Juan Antonio Fletcher, who for a Spanish rider has Brilliant. always excelled in these tough Belgian races. Always nice to see. He's become quite a popular boy, Juan Antonio Fletcher, these last two years since he shot to fame by winning a stage of the Tour de France at Marseille, I think it was. And um, Hushoff too, another powerful man on the far right. He'll have a little bit of a problem like Maggie Baxter will on the Kemmelberg, but if they can hang on, it's a long run off the second time over the Kemmel to the finishing line. 67 kilometers to go. It's about 43 miles, something like that. And Cancellara, of course, uh, made his name in the Tour de France this year. There's the little details for you, the Vidainberg. 
it's uh, just under a kilometre long as an average grade around about one in ten just swings around up here and uh, in fact at the top end of this climb when the race turns to the left hand side if they were to turn right in 500 meters they would be right at the French border because we're right on the borderline for a many number of kilometers here between France and Belgium lots of battles done in this part of the world in the First World War and basically the Kemmelberg is one of the biggest memorials to one of those battles and a lot of Frenchmen perished in that battle there on the slopes of the Kemmelberg just for the sake of a hundred meters in fact, many, many years ago, the Kemmelberg was underwater, but the ocean's long since receded and left its mark. So the breakaway now looks like it is going to develop into what is the main peloton here. Approximately 25, 26 riders in the group. All the Quick Step boys paying attention. They've got four riders here in Bonin, Kretschkins, Hulsmans and Carnarvon. Everybody's going to watch Tom Bonin. Uh, but there are riders here with the capability of getting the better of him. And uh, one there, Lars Mikkelsen, also keeping his nose clean at the front. I think with so many sprinters in the group, we can see an attack coming to try and split the field here. That's Hank Vogels there in second place. Uh, because of the fact that there are so many top sprinters, I do feel that we'll try and see somebody at least try to split this group. Because if they go together to the finish line, they're basically handing over the chances to men like Tom Boonen and, of course, Tom Steeles. There's the left-hand turn at the top of the climb. Turn to the right. It's France just over the road. But these guys have made the turn nice and safely. It's a little flat part of land here, and it's a very big tourist centre for the Belgians throughout the summer months. And there's a small windmill just up the top. They used to actually go along this road and take a, a right-hand turn and around the windmill and then come back onto the same road. And they've stopped doing this over the last couple of seasons. There you can just see the road tilting up again in front. That's the Rodeberg or the Red Mountain. Well, the field then at 1.10 now, the latest time check. So they're holding, but they're not getting back at all. And once over the Kemmel, that gap, I think, will stretch. Not all of the riders, I don't think, will get over the Kemmel. First time of asking. It's a brute of a cobble climb. And there'll be a big crowd waiting there because it crosses it twice. So everybody knows they've got good value for money there. Not that they're paying anyway. And on the top two, the local cafe will have the television on. So in between visits over the Kemmel of the race, they can pop in, have a beer and watch the race go by. A lot of cyclists will be on the Kemmel today as we move on now. And it's interesting, but Quick Step keeping control of this race. I mean, it would be incredible if Bonham was to go back to back here. It's been done before. Uh, but it would mean he would have two in the bag and one to go with Paddy Roubaix to equal the enormous feat of one man, Rick Van Looy, or Rick Two, as we always called him. A brilliant sprinter, former world champion, the only man to have won all three races. He did it back in 1962. It's the steepest part of the climb here. It actually kicks in at around about 15%. It's not a very long climb, but you can see the faces on these riders uh, quite interestingly indicating just how difficult this race has been. And in fact, after what was a big springtime day in the Tour of Flanders just three or four days ago, it has really changed completely to around about 15 degrees Celsius here. Just tagging onto the back there, Nico Eichhout, pretty much isolated. He's got to ride a very sensible tactical race over the next few kilometers because if he has a mechanical incident, he's got absolutely no chance of getting back on his own or getting back without any help from a teammate. And Quick Step are in a very powerful situation because they know they've got the ace man in the pack here. They've got Tom Bonin on board. And I think their tactics from now to the finish will be to try and keep this group as compact as possible because they will feel that Tom Bonin can finish it off quite easily for them. Well, keeping the pressure on as they freewheel down. There's the style of Hank Vogels, hands gripping those bars. It was downhill at 100 kilometres now when he had his nasty crash in the United States. And he's just uh, come off there at around about 80, 50 miles an hour. Breaks hard on for the right-hander. And the breakaway now, staying pretty much together. There's the following cars, and there'll be a gap now, quite a long gap, because you can see by the number of cars behind this leading group just how many teams have got men in. And because of that, with nobody to chase except T-Mobile, who didn't put a man in the breakaway, as far as we can work out, 
uh, they again have made a huge mistake here. It's very strange because it's one of the top teams in the world, T-Mobile, and we expect them to be competitive in races like this. And they all seemed very confident before the start this morning that either Eric Zabel or Andreas Clear were certainly going to live up to their reputations of being pre-race favourites. But not one of them has made this very serious split of around about 25 riders in strength. There's the main field. In fact, Phil, they've actually come back quite rapidly there over the last few kilometres. It is a little bit foreshortened by the fact that we're looking from a fairly high altitude from the helicopter here, but certainly they don't seem to have given up and they realize they've got to, to really try and do something special if they want to save their race here this afternoon. Well, this is the second group. that I've got 30 riders in that breakaway counting from the helicopter and I've only got 26 names, so we could still stand to be surprised here by one or two big names in the group. Um, we haven't uh, been told of any big names in the group, but I certainly haven't seen a T-Mobile jersey in that leading group. Some sharp bends now as we reposition for the next couple of climbs to come, culminating with the left turn up the Kemmel. They have brought them back actually, Paul, about 10 seconds or so, not enough of course. This is the drive and Uscatel are doing some driving now, which must be one of the few teams who've got men left or not in the breakaway. And there's no sign of T-Mobile chasing, which is significant. They might have decided they're going to rest to fight another day now. They've made a big mistake. They have, but, they have, but I think very shortly we're going to see that they will actually stop those team cars in there because the main field are actually starting to get onto the tailpipes close, of the following cars. So it's a, a difficult decision for the referees to pull in now because if they pull them out, this group here will have only one neutral service car to cover them in case of any incidents. This is actually a slightly different approach here to the Monteberg as well. We've taken a left-hand turn a lot earlier than the small town of Loka. Now, let's see just what happened here. Now, this is uh, oh, certainly not the way country. to ride cyclocross. A little bit of cross-country here by Credit Agrico <coughs> as they continue. Lost sight, maybe just nearly touched the wheel, took a little bit of a diversion for the better. Anyway, good bike handling. Back in the action again. And that was uh, Geoffroy Le Cat, or Jeffy the Fourth, who went off course there. Well, the team cars are still stuck in behind there, but at 50 seconds, I feel, Phil, that very shortly they're going to have to stop those team cars. This is a new approach to the Monteberg. That's the right-hand bend, but straight in front of you there, in fact, is the Kemmelberg. What the race is going to do today, taking this right-hand turn, it's going to go around the bottom of the Kemmelberg to come up the Monteberg. Now, there you can see the referee stopping all the cars because the gap has come inside of the the one minute mark mm. 1.3 kilometers to the Monteberg it might be just that little bit too late and in fact the team cars have decided to ignore the referee and uh, pulled off again to try and make sure that they keep their riders covered for as long as possible but no prisoners being taken in that peloton at all the pressure is on to try and pull it back I think from T-Mobile's point of view well this is a huge problem for the referees you can see how narrow the roads are here and this is the way the race will continue for a while once over the Kemmel, they get marginally wilder for, w wider for a bit, but that gap is coming down. There's one or two riders since they might have the peloton here as they're closing it to 48 seconds. 39 miles to go to the finish. And uh, 30 riders, I thought, about to decide this race, but maybe uh, a desperate attempt up the, up the big climb. That looks like Ralph Aldag, but it must, I thought he'd given up. Uh, so it might be uh, Bookstead, this new boy who looks like him in the breakaway, in the chasing group rather, this new, uh, new rider on the on T-Mobile the squad. He rode very, very well in the Tour de Flanders, first time we'd seen him in action there. So back up with the leading group, that's the small town of Loker just in front there where you can see the church and they've actually cut out quite a big part of the circuit here. What they'll do in a few moments time is take a left-hand turn and begin the climb up to the summit of the Monteberg. They're still holding on to a pretty good advantage. They shouldn't get pulled back before the start of the Kemmel, and that will give them advantage of trying to have a good sort out. I think we might even see a split in this leading group over the Kemmelberg, and if it comes down to a smaller group of 15 or 20 riders, then I think we'll see the change in this race, and we will see the names of the winners start to move up to the top. 47 seconds, and I, re I bet the referee now is very worried with the flotilla of vehicles behind this breakaway because they're chasing the tail of the cars now, not the breakaway. That will give them inspiration. As the Quick Step boys look over the shoulders, sorry about the picture breakup. Uh, that's because of the live coverage, but Monteberg is our next target now. 
just uh, less than a kilometre, it's only 296 metres, short, stabby little climb, very good road surface, and it's the stepping stone to the Kemmel. 5.5% average, so it's not really a, a tough climb, uh, but it does hurt the legs at high speed. Here we are, we're on it. What might actually make a difference to this race formation now is the fact that I could just see a few drops of rain starting to appear on the camera lens from the helicopter and if that is the case and the descent of the Kemmelberg has got a, a little bit of moisture on Ouch. it mm. we could see one or two riders taking an exit to the left hand side quick step I think very happy with the situation here they're setting the tempo they'll have Tom Boonen in third or fourth place there and they'll try and put him into the bottom of the Kemmel in a nice comfortable position. I was so impressed with the way he handled himself in the Tour of Flanders. For a man who's built his reputation of a sprinter, to win in a solo effort like that on a course like that is an indication that this guy is going to be a real star of the future. They're pulling the team cars off. A sensible move by the race referees because otherwise it would be chaos going into the corner before the Kemmel. Wow, that was lucky to get them over on this uh, little stretch of road just before we hit the Kemmelberg. And this is some hard riding being done now. Chances are the gap will open now because there'll be a vacuum formed between this break and the chasing bunch. There aren't many riders back in this bunch able to do much chasing right now. Uh, we've got the Phonak champion uh, on the front here, Uros Mern, trying to bring his team back into play. But they, haven't, they haven't got anybody in the breakaway whatsoever, Phonak, and they'd like to do something about that, so they've got to chase. And that is the big um, T-Mobile rider, the newcomer Marcus Burkhart, who is uh, in that pinkish jersey because Aldag has pulled out. And uh, Uskadel also trying to give a hand. So they're still trying to put it back together and they're doing a good job right now, but this is an act of desperation because if they don't shut it down very quickly, uh, then once over the top of the Kemmel, that group will fly away. It's going to be chaos, actually, because I can see a situation arising here where they actually just get onto the back of this group just as we begin the Kemmelberg. And that's something that Cervais Carnarvon here on the front, I'm sure, has already figured out. Just a couple of cars behind this group now. One is the neutral service car. One is a car of the race referee. Lars Mikkelsen from CSC moving to the front here. He's obviously going to be very attentive. These guys know that once they hit the Kemmelberg, I have a feeling Tom Boonen is going to give us a demonstration of how good a climber he is on these very nasty short Flandrian ascents. Well, numerically, it's a good move by uh, Credit Agricole to that breakaway. They've got four riders up there at the moment, including their top sprinter, Kersi Poo, and their big strong man, Tor Hushoft. So they're in a very good position. There'll be nobody chasing from Credit Agricole just now, but the gap is still coming down half a minute. As we panned out, we should get the distance exactly now. That's a sign of an angry peloton still working very hard. It's not as big as it was at the start this morning. But certainly uh, it's, uh, there are plenty of riders there. There's a lot of passengers, though, because there are so many teams represented in the breakaway of just on 30 riders. And I think uh, Cervais Canavan would like the television motorbike to move a bit further away. Because I think he realises uh, very shortly he's going to set himself up for this bend. And this is the bend at the bottom of the Kemmelberg. He's led them onto the start there. You can hear the crowd. Once they've seen Tom Bonin there, they're really getting excited. 18.7% at the steepest part this climb. And that's right up at the top and an average of 11.5%. It's only 400 metres long, but ouch, it doesn't have hurt. We've both ridden this, Paul, and it seems like it's about 10 miles long. It is such a tough climb. When they come round this bend here, they will see it kick them in the face. The cobblestones are not flat and easy. They do shake you to death. But it quite clearly here, the boys from uh, De Vitamin, uh, Quick Step rather, are trying now to split this field and get the strong men away. Bagstead's ridden well here to take third or fourth wheel. That's a good move by him. And he's going to keep a close eye on affairs. Fletcher's also up here too, as is Tor Hushoft. And Lars Mikkelsen on the rails there, and also not too far away. Baden Cooker's hung on too. Tom Steeles is in a spot of bother there, halfway down. And the rest of them have suddenly cracked. Well, Tom Boone and uh, really demonstrating at the front there how you should ride if you are the leader of a team. He's dictating the pace. Tom Steeles, on the other hand, has never really much enjoyed this climb at all, but he's done very well to keep himself just about in contact. And I'm very impressed there with the ride of Baden Cook, who certainly now is giving himself a very good chance of getting himself a very big win. Well, it's short, sharp, and very nasty. The leaders are over the top, and they will descend very quickly here. It is a very, very treacherous descent. There's Steele's going over now. 
It is not for the nervous because it is dead straight over cobblestones. And frankly, you don't touch your brakes. You just close your eyes and wait till your bike runs off on the smooth roads uh, because it is a nervous descent. And they split that breakaway. Now, the group that's chasing at 33 seconds could well tag on to these boys and find that the main part has already sped off. Well, that's uh, exactly what Tom Boonen wanted to do, split that group. It was starting to be just that little bit too big at 30 riders strong. And if they can reduce the numbers to make it a smaller, manageable group, I think we'll see them start to kick in the turbo again. A little bit of a respite at the top here before that very dangerous, scary descent. Hushoft on the descent now, Boonen not too far away. I'll tell you one thing about this descent. It is so scary to actually look down wow. this descent because it is like walking off the top of a mountain. It is is and uh, Steele's coming down a little bit more caution here but should get across the gap after the tent and there's also Canavan there who was the first onto the cobbles it's split into three groups got 12 men at the moment at the front flat trying to tire. go clear I think somebody had a flat tyre then I saw Canavan looking across and it may well have just have been Hank Vogels this is an unbelievable descent. You, the only way to go down this descent Phil is just to close your eyes and pray that you can keep the bike in a straight line it looks as if Steele's uh, may well just have got across there. There's a small group coming in here. But that's a, a nice move, I think, for the leading group because having reduced it in numbers, they're down to a manageable size. Now, as we pan right, I thought there were about 12 riders going clear. I'm back with the leaders here now. They swelled a little bit, I think. There's more than 12 riders got themselves up here just now. And Tony just tagged here, yeah, Tony Cruz has made the split. He's the only discovery man. He's got to fly the flag now. The captain's uh, quit the ship, and so he's going to have to see if he can get a result for discovery. And that's Henk Vogels just behind him there. No, it's not. It's his teammate there. Uh, it'd be uh, Simone Kadamura, I think it is. That's the result of the... Well, I'm not sure where that. They're calling it sprint number two. It wasn't the result over the top of the climb, but they have these sprints along the course which we're not seeing contested, but there is a, a special prize for that as well. 56 kilometres to go. The first battle of the Kemmel is behind. The first decision, I think, has been made here. Bone and the man that made it hurt is now just slipping back into the pack. Number one on his back. Last year's winner, Mikkelsen, is marking him. In fact, Bone and looking around to see who's there. He's got the split. It's a, just over a dozen. They should come back in that immediate chase group. But this is what he wanted, Paul. He wanted to thin that field down. He wanted to thin the field down, but I don't think he wanted to be quite as isolated as he is. I think he wanted the rest of his teammates up there alongside him, and that's probably what he's looking back for. And, of course, to see the position of Tom Steeles. And I think Tom Steeles is actually locked in that small group of riders, about four or five strong, who hasn't quite yet made the junction. Yes, I think you're right, but um, don't forget his team were working so hard to get him to the base of the Kemmelberg. Once they got onto the climb, they didn't really have the legs to go up with him. And so now he's played some cards there, and he may have lost some valuable uh, players along the way. Kadamuro is not a bad sprinter, and he's tacked onto the back here for Domina Vacanzi. He'll be thinking if he can get round this a second time with the group, he'll have a chance of winning this, and that would be a surprise win. Uh, Kadamuro from the Domino Vacanzi team. The last Italian winner was Cipollini in 2002. And Lars Mikkelsen, he was the last Danish winner in 1995. Well, that group needs to get themselves uh, organised. They've had a look round. They've seen who's present. So this is the town of Kemmel. They'll go out on a small circuit of around about 15 kilometres before hitting the Monteberg again and, of course, going over the Kemmel for the last time before then lining up for the big, long, straight roads down towards the finishing town of Wevelgem. This is the second group. This is the group of Tom Steeles. Now, they're only around about 10 seconds back, and I think Tom Steeles will be uh, quite happy with the situation. He's never really enjoyed the Kemmelberg, even when he was at the top of his form. Just getting on the back there, that was Wilfred Kretchens as well, so Tom Boonham will be getting some reinforcements coming up from the rear. Tom Steeles' group is going to make the junction in the next minute or so. And Nick out. Sebastian Lang is Gerolsteiner here. And number 14 is Matty Heyman, the Australian. They're going to get back this time. There's Tom Steeles now, just wondering where he is. Passing through the feeding station here, and I think they're going to reintegrate into that leading group. But there won't be 30 riders this time. Oh, Matty Heyman just on the back there. From a moment ago, Rabobank looked exceptionally strong with three riders in this leading group. 
I think they've lost one or two there. I didn't see Carsten Kroon. Great ride here by Tony Cruz on the front for Discovery Channel. He's a rider who on that team has been waiting for the last couple of seasons to break through and get himself the chance. Boonen in fifth position there, just shaking his bottle up, having taken a bottle on board as they went through the feeding station. The lime green jersey just over to the left-hand side is Magnus Baxter, who is riding a very sensible race. His big objective is Paris-Roubaix this weekend, the attempt to try and defend his title from last year but if he can get a win on the way he's not going to say no he isn't he told me at the start that he would have a go today he says because you need a hard ride after having uh, a few days off since the Tour de Flanders and uh, then you need a good rest and have a go at uh, at Paris-Roubaix a lot of riders don't think that way they think of just having an easy week but uh, Baxter likes hard days when he goes cycling and he's made it another one today well, he's absolutely right. And the majority, and it always seems to have been the recipe for Pai Roubaix, is a very hard game, Wavell game. Even if you don't win, it's not important. Then a good day over the cobblestones on the Thursday. Rest up on Friday and Saturday, then get out for the Queen of the Classics on Sunday. That's the remnants of the group. And I think that might be the front end now of riders escaping from the peloton because it looks as if there are one or two pink jerseys in there of T-Mobile. Well, they're still a long way behind. It's 38 seconds, but it's now a long way in reality, I think. Henk Vogels. Henk Vogels, and uh, let's have a look over. This is the re-merger. So Henk must have been left there. Yeah, Henk, I think, got caught out. He probably did quite a bit of work to try and make sure that Tom Steele's uh, started that climb in good position. There is Cerves Carnarvon. He was the man who basically placed Tom Boonen in the ideal position going into the corner at the bottom of the Kemmelberg. His job done now. He will just defend here for the next few kilometres. And Stefan de Jong also a victim of the Kemmelberg first time round. And so to Stefan Addison there of Barlow World. So they're bringing pass back uh, to the upcoming uh, head of the peloton. About 12, 13 riders. It may have swelled a little bit. It might be 16 boys at the front just now. Still a big gap, though, 36 seconds. The team cars are moving their way forward, trying to get out of the way, trying to keep everybody covered. As we pull back, we get a chance to see just where the main field is, and it's uh, still a fairly large main field there. There are all the team cars behind them. I would say that that third group on the road is uh, hovering at around about 45 seconds. But once they join that group in front there, I think we'll see a general slowing down for a few kilometres. Well, let's have a look. Actually, still Kretzkens now has got to the front. This is the chase group, I beg your pardon. This is this Hulsman's on the right. This is the chase group here with Addison taking them through. And it's... Uh, well, I'm a little bit of le lethargy settling in there now. It, it, these boys could push home the advantages they've got. I think they would uh, move ahead. This is a big chance for Antonio Cruz, this, uh, to fly the flag for the American Discovery team. He's on his own. He should make use of the stronger men in the group. Uh, but it's a good chance for him to excel in his own right. Nico Ekut, who's on form but sat at the back of that break and got split off at the Kemmelberg. He's pulled a smart one because he's just come back onto this leading group. Well, he has to ride very sensibly because, as I said just before, he's completely on his own. He's got no teammates, no friends in the group. He has to make sure that he uh, conserves as much energy as possible because if this group splits up again towards the end, he's going to have to cover the moves all on his own. And there's Tom Steele. He had to come across as well, but now there are fewer riders up here. And they know if Tom can get over the Kemmel next time, he'll be in with a real shout of becoming another man to have won this race on three occasions. There's a view from the base of the Kemmelberg, or the cobblestones on the way down. Just see the pounding the bike takes, never mind the body. It really is a, a horrific descent. Dead straight, and uh, you fly down it. you just got to hope you don't flat on the way. You certainly want to make sure that uh, both tyres are kept uh, nice and under pressure because if you have a flat tyre on that descent, it really is quite scary. So this is the composition now. Boone and Kretchen's Hulsman's three riders from Quickstep. Heyman, Kroon in there for Rabobank. Cruz, Bernati, Eichhout, Breschel and Mikhailsen, two riders there as well. And uh, Tom Steeles has got a teammate in the group with him, Nico Matan. That could be very important down towards the end. And in fact, uh, they're saying that that's Fabio Baldato in the leading group there, but I'm pretty sure it, in fact, uh, wasn't Baldato. And well, fact, we've never had his name, but there were one or two names that we never got in that breakaway. Matan was one of them, first time we've seen him mentioned. I'm pretty sure, in fact, it is Fabian Cantillara. Well, he certainly was in the original split, that's for sure. In the group as well, of course, as Juan Antonio Fletcher. Once again, they're approaching the uh, 
the difficult climb of Vidayanberg or the, the Black Mountain. The gap hovering at three quarters of a minute there. And uh, once again, you know, Quick Step Phil putting themselves into a pretty good situation here because they've got a lot of riders there. Baden Cook has ridden very well. He too is one of those riders, riders who is isolated. And uh, he's going to have to take on board drinks and keep himself nice and covered. And if they don't pay any attention to Baden Cook, he's the kind of guy who could cause mm. a big surprise because he seemed very confident at the start this morning. And he's got a very good turn of speed. After all, he was the winner of the points jersey in the Tour de France a couple of years ago. Yes, he's never had a great result in this race either. Uh, and yet he is a fairly good one-day bike rider. But he's got his drink so he can settle back in. And he, he wasn't in trouble, I don't think, on the camel last time around. He looked he pretty, was, uh, pretty good. He was very comfortable there. He's taking on board a drink called Extran, which is a high-energy drink. That little carton that he was about to drink there was the equivalent to about six or seven pieces of bread. But it goes in in a very concentrated style. A good thing to take about this stage of the race with 50 kilometers or about an hour and 10 minutes left of racing. That'll keep his energy levels topped up, and they'll be topped up just before he gets to the Camelberg next time. There's Tony Cruz at the back there for discovery. Tom Steeles is looking pretty good. I know he doesn't like the Camelberg, but he rode over it very sensibly. And he's got the benefit of having won this race in 96 and 99. There he is with his mouth open. Just does enough to say, uh, I'm going through, I'm doing my bit of the pacemaking, but making no effort at all. Through and off is all he's doing. And uh, Lang, the Gerolsteiner rider, goes through and off. And then Hulsmans. And here comes Anthony Cruz. And this is a nice little working group now. They're settling in as they make their way round to the Kemmel for the second time. And then those that survive over the top of the Kemmel can start to think of how they're going to finish in Revelgum, where there's a strong tailwind on at the moment. And the magnolia tree in the, in the city centre here, in the town centre, is uh, absolutely beautiful today in full spring blossom, getting blown about a bit by the tailwind. That's cookie. Getting his uh, drink on board, there's Nico Eichhout. Now watch out for him, as you said, Phil. He's had a pretty good start to his season. And there is Nico Matin, who was uh, looking to do a good ride in the Tour of Flanders. He's a very good bike rider when it comes to these one-day races. Maggie Backstead is going to be very happy with being in this situation. Now he can also take a little bit of a back seat because I think over the next few kilometers, we'll start to see a lot more tactical maneuvering taking place. Uh, you get a glance there of Lars Mikkelsen of Team CSC, the former winner of this event. Boonen, not afraid at all to do no. any work at the front of the group. He did, and his team did a lot of work in the Tour of Flanders, and I actually thought last Sunday, Phil, that they were doing too much work too early, but they obviously knew something we didn't know. Quick count there, 20 riders surviving from the 30 that started over the Kemmel, so that's just knocked a third of them out. These are the chasers, and we're going back down the road almost a minute here. Still Uros Mern setting the pace at the front, but it looks as though these boys now, and there's, a, there's quite a few pink jerseys come through here from T-Mobile. It's amazing. This was the top team for years at this time of the season, and they haven't placed a man in that front group. No sign of Zabel. Uh, we, we know that Aldag has packed in, but I wouldn't surprise me if Eric also has now decided to ride home and forget this for the day because he's missed the move as the way he's feeling. But Fonak are trying to pull something out of this, but the losing ground as we speak is now out to 54 seconds. So poor old Robbie Hunter, who's had a rotten start in his classic campaign. He's had so many uh, mechanical problems and falls at the wrong time. He had them again in, uh, in the Tour of Flanders. And now he's missed the breakaway here in Ghent Wevergum. So he's going to play everything on a great ride in Paris Roubaix on Sunday. A lot of riders are going to count on doing a good performance in Paris Roubaix. This group is not organised at all. You've got just a couple of riders from T Mobile trying to do some of the pacemaking. But this group has so many passengers because there's a lot of riders in that leading group of 20. So most of the guys in this group now have absolutely no reason at all to share the pacemaking at the front and to pick up the chase. This is West Alter. It's a, a Kasayan, which means cobblestones, around about 400 meters. Once they come off this cobblestone section, the road starts to tilt up to the old uh, Black Mountain. The climb that they came over just around about 25 minutes ago kicks up towards the top, gets just that little bit more difficult, then it's the Red Mountain, then in and around the small roads in the Herveland before going over the Kemmelberg for the final time. And I think they'll be quite happy to see and get the information that the time gap has again crept up to almost the one-minute mark. 
Holtzmans and Kretzkin seem to be the two boys who got back. Seves Canavan hasn't rejoined here for, uh, for the team leader, Bonin. But this is beginning to shape very nicely for Bonin now. And he's shown us his confidence and his penchant for riding these races. Wouldn't surprise me if he tries for another lone win if he keeps on with this sort of form. He said his condition is excellent, full of confidence. People are saying he has the mentality of one Eddie Merckx. And we all know what the cannibal was like when he sends victory. Merckx himself has won this race on three occasions too, in 67, 70 and 73 for Eddie. Uh, but nobody's won it four times yet. This is the Acht of Volkers, the, the following group, the second group on the road. They're still holding it at around about the one minute margin. And they're still hoping they can do something special and pull this group back together if they can. But it's a long, hard chase now. On the front there, Gregory Rast, the Swiss national champion. Uros Moon is moving up there as well. And uh, I haven't seen Robbie Hunter in this group, but I wonder if that may be why these guys are trying to move forward to, to whip up the pacemaking, because they feel that uh, they've got a chance of getting the sprint towards the end. This is the team that was brought into the Pro Tour right at the very last moment. At one time, there were only 19 official teams in the Pro Tour. Fon Fonak finally getting position number 20. I suppose you'd have to say at the 12th hour. Indeed you would. Marcus Burke out the T-Mobile boy there. Making a very impressive uh, appearance this last couple of days of racing for the, the T-Mobile squad. Now we're heading up to the Vidanyberg again and then we're on our way to the Kemmel and I think there'll be a major attack on the Kemmel this time. And I think Bonan can be expected to uh, head up the charge and he might get marked out by one or two surprises. But this is the leading group, and Tom Steeles will want to hang on there because if he, he believes uh, he can do something if it is possible, but he's got to get to the finish to do it. Just looking here at Jan Kersipu. I'm surprised he's still there, to be absolutely honest. Jan doesn't like uh, these hills going up, but if he gets over the top, he'll be a serious contender for the win. But he seems to be a different bike rider this year, a lot more happy with his team. Uh, he's very comfortable. Saw him racing in the early part of the season in the Tour Down Under. And I think he feels uh, a lot more at home with Credit Agricole, and he may well try to give them uh, victory here. As you said, Phil, he's been one of the most consistent riders at the start of the season over the last number of years, but he's never really had himself that big magical win. And he probably realizes that, and he's going to try and stay in contact over the slopes of the Kemmelberg last time as we see Big Maggie on the frontier, Backstead setting the tempo. He really is uh, giving himself a full tryout, and if you want to hurt your body just a little bit before the upcoming Queen of the Classics, Paris Bay, not a bad way to do it, riding on the front of the breakaway. No, it isn't. And we've got the first, second, and third place finisher in this race last year in this breakaway. Boonen, Bagstead, and Kersipu. And uh, it could well be that they could repeat that. I wonder what the odds would be on that happening. Uh, but Kersey Poo now has won 121 races in a career which started back in 1992. This is Moon as he continues to set the pace with not a lot of help, I must say, as they look to be uh, slowly uh, getting back into contention, just like they did the previous lap, uh, just in time to get blown away again on the big climb. Could be a hard chase, but they have managed again to nail it back to the half a minute mark. This they haven't given really up been, at all, have they? This has really been a yo-yo. It's mm. been up to a minute, back down to a half a minute, back out again, and now it's again starting to be reduced in numbers. Uh, this is a serious move here by Team Phonak. They realize they have to do something special because there's a lot depending on their performances here. Thomas Vokler there just over to the left-hand side. Nice to see the fresh na French national champion. This is the top of the Vidania Beg, or the... Black right. Mountain. We'd love to see a French winner. We've never had one in this race since Philippe Gaumont in back in 1997, who left the sport under a cloud last year. These are the leaders now, as we look down on a group of some 20 riders. Set fair for the Kemmel now. And uh, the last rattle up the cobblestones. The sky is looking a bit black up front. That could be the, uh, the uh, final... Uh, breaking the straw, if you like, that breaks the camel's back. If if it does rain on this leading group, that will turn it upside down. It would Kersipu riding defensively at the back here, just on the wheel of Nico Eichhouts. This is the Rodeberg, the Red Mountain, 15.5% at its steepest part. It really is, again, one of those very strange climbs here in the Herverland, uh, over towards the the western part of Belgium. It's a climb that begins nice and steadily, then kicks up towards the end. 
Mikkelsen on the front, looking over his shoulder at Matty Heyman. They're whipping up the pacemaking. Look how Steels is riding it to the front end of the group. He doesn't want to get caught out so close to a chance of getting himself another win here. Nice piece of riding by Matt Heyman, this. He's got his place on a very, very good team, Rabobank. And uh, this will go down well with the director sportif. He's working very hard in this breakaway group. Meanwhile, the chasers still trying to make something of it. Rast, the champion of Switzerland, being marked here by a rider from... I'm not sure whether it's not Zanini who's just tagged on behind him there from Fasa Bortolo. Cancellara accelerating over the top there. This is the top of the Rodebeg. They drop off this hill at uh, speeds approaching 60 miles an hour. There's a big long line there. Being very attentive, Lars Mikkelsen. Quick push there. I think that was Nico Mata on the front. As they go down, they'll face this right-hand turn. Now, what confusion this would be for the leading group, having led over the long circuit from the Kemmelberg to be caught just at the bottom. And at 30 seconds, that second group on the road have got a very good chance now of just making the contact at around about the Monteberg. Well, this would be amazing. And hats off to the two national champions there, Mern and Rast, because they've done most of the pacemaking. This brought this race almost back together. 27 seconds as they take uh, the sharp right-hand turn. If you can hear the drums and everything, it's because they're about to send a band through the finishing line. We've just had a circuit race here, what they call a kermess. That's finished, so the band has come out to entertain. Well, that is very close. This is the left-hand turn. They'll go through this very nice cycling area of the Herverland, almost to the bottom of the Kemmelberg, and take a right-hand turn to the bottom of the Monteberg. Tom Boone and sitting at the back there. Not too worried about it splitting up in this section. That's the important thing about racing in Belgium, having the knowledge of where the wind direction is going to be. There's the chasing group. It's close. It's only just 25 seconds, so there's going to be a bit of chaos in that group right now. And I wonder if Robbie Hunter is in that group for Team Fonak. I didn't see him because it's his two teammates on the front doing most of the chasing. Uh, Rast of Switzerland and Uros Moon. But there was definitely another rider in there from Fonak, and they could well have been thinking about uh, uh, Gutierrez, who's a pretty fast finisher himself. Just on 40 riders in that group right now. And we can't get down amongst it, it appears, because we've gone uh, back up to the leaders here. I think they're on the tail of the, of the chasing group just now. No, this is the leading group. There they are. What a lovely picture that is, too. A battle of the, of the Belgian... Uverland, as uh, Paul refers to it, as we head out now towards the Kemmel again. Tiny roads, these very small. It's almost impossible to get three or four riders across. That's the leading group there. Tom Boonen still sitting four or five riders from the back. Not at all worried. I think we'll see... Um, that tells me he might be planning a little ascent of the Kemmelberg. I think you could be right. If they can survive to the Kemmelberg, he'd probably try and split that group going over here. Now, the situation is going to be that that second group has chased so hard for around about 15 kilometres that they will have to do something pretty special if they're going to stay in contact with the front group. And most of the work has been done by the riders from Team Phone but they're now getting a bit of assistance coming through from the Team Mobile squad, and that's Marcus Burkhardt. And I did get a feeling that I might have just caught a sign of Eric Zabel in this second group, Phil. There is another well. rider with uh, dark glasses on from Team Mobile who looked as if it might have been Zabel, and this may be why Team Mobile have gone to the front. This would make sense. They're not going to waste their energy working for nobody. And it could be that Hunter and Zabel and or Clyre are in that group. And this is their last hope now because this is going to all to a desperate chase once over the top of the Kemmel to the finish in Revelgum. This is not a huge gap anymore now. These boys are, aren't thinking over the top of the Kemmelberg. Their job is to get the leaders across to that breakaway and then just ride home to the finish. And that's why they're giving 100% of their effort here. This is Mern bringing them around the corner. Burkhart is round in second place. It was a Gelsteiner rider who's gone round in third. Still 23 seconds. That's a split off the back of that group. These guys are really suffering to stay in contact with that very second good race chase right group. Now. It really has been splitting up and reforming since they actually got to the coast at Ostend. At one stage along the seafront, the race was split into three separate portions. They turned inland and got the headwind, and it came back together again. But ever since they've been riding around here in the Herverland, the area around the Kemmelberg, it's been a question of uh, survival for everybody in this group. Here we are, back with the leaders. This is Uros Mern 
himself is having a great great season as he continues to help his team at the moment but he's the champion of uh, Slovakia they've not given up at all they realize there's a very good chance they have to keep the pressure on in this group these men on the front now are working for their leaders and they want to try and make the contact uh, before the Monteberg. There's Eric Zabel just over on the right-hand side. That's and Stuart O'Grady in this group as well. So this is a, a very serious second group. Now, the fact is that that leading group of around about 20 riders have put so much effort into this. Guys like Eric Zabel, if they've been riding sensibly, will be feeling quite fresh at the moment of contact. Well, it's got to be a big effort by Zabel here, and that could put him back. Remember the story of a couple of years ago when the horse bolted not far from where we are now, but it was on the run into the finish and knocked Eric off his bike into a ditch. And the young lady who owned that, I think she was 11 years of age, apologised, so he sent her one of his racing strips and said it didn't really matter. Anyway, this is the group now. This is desperate moments because Cofidis have got nobody in that front group. So Stuart O'Grady is relying heavily now on teammates of others to close the gap. There he is, just tucking that white jersey, about eight men down the line. Zabel will begin to think it's just possible here with an explosive ride up the Kemmel. 16 seconds, they are chipping it off. This is quite a climax to the Gent Wevergum this year. We're now on the Monteberg with a leading group of 20 riders. Now, if you've got the power, 14, 13 seconds, the difference between the leading group of 20 and that very serious second group on the road. Now, if you've got the power in your legs, you can bridge 10 or 15 seconds on the slopes of the Kemmelberg, and most certainly you can on the descent. Oh the speed, you can see the difference in the speed now. We're on the Monteberg. And the fact is that... Uh, Huge effort required now. I have a funny feeling it's all going to come back together just before the start, and there's a move here from Cancellara? the front group. Looks like Cancellara trying to go clear. Well, this is the time to do it now, just when they think they're catching you, break their hearts and their spirits. This is, uh, I think it's pretty certain it's Cancellara here trying to get a away. This will cause a reaction from the likes of Tom Bonin. They're sending all the cars out of the gap now. It's every man for himself, a flat tyre now, and, and the race is over. Nico Matin on the front here. He realises they want to stay clear to the foot of the Kelmenberg, so he's whipped it up. Boonen now, you see, very sensibly moving up into second place. A little bit of a split in this leading group now. Magnus Backstead is there as well. Backstead uh, riding very well here in the middle uh, race between Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. And this is turning out to be a, a big battle for the next turning into the slopes of the Kemmelberg this time. 24 years of age, Fabian Cancellara. Oh, I'd say it's one Antonio Fletcher. I must say it doesn't off look like Cancellara. But we'll go with the director of television and that's a good move by Fletcher. They've completely split up under the effort here. Oh, no, it looks better now. It does look like Fletcher now. Now we can see a little bit of light on his face. It looks on our pictures as though somebody's painted the sky, but in fact, uh, this is a very, very good move. This man one day is going to win a big one-day race because he is such a good bike rider and it's very unusual for the Spanish to provide us with good classic one-day riders. Boonen may be suffering here from uh, too much attention, I think. This is the attack from Fletcher. But Boonen has to take on everybody now. He's become the man to beat uh, at this time of the year. And he's not going to get a lot of help. Fletcher now out on his own. He's going to be the first man to take the left-hand turn into the bottom of the Kemmelberg. And there's a reaction coming on behind him as well. They've fanned across the road now. The, the reason here is that Tom Boonen doesn't have any teammates left, but Maggie Baxter has seen the danger there in the lime green jersey of Leaky Gas. A slight split over the next group, and then the main field is still hovering at around about 10 to 15 seconds. There you can get a chance to see the whole of the race in one straight. Well, this is an intriguing game we're ever going this year now. The sky gets darker. But one, uh, Mr. Fletcher has gone clear. No wins for him this year. Had a couple of wins last year. Notably, he finished seventh in this race last year. So he knows what it's like to survive. There is a spot on the camera lens there. It could be rain, or it just might be water spraying off the riders. A bit of sweat, maybe. But Fletcher has made a gamble here to try and get to the Kemmelberg first. Well, he's done that because here we go. Now, where will he be once we get over the top of the climb? Round the left-hander and now 
it's all or nothing here for Fletcher. He wants to get over the top and try and ride for home. It won't be easy. He's got some 36 kilometres to go when he's over the summit. It's a long way to go to the finish for a man on his own, especially in these conditions. I know it is a slight tailwind, but I think what he's expecting here is to see a split from the front end of this group and a small, solid group forming at the front end of the race. I wouldn't be surprised to see Tom Bonin accelerating, although Bonin is there in about fourth or fifth position. He must realise at this point he's got to do something special if he wants to win Game Wave again for a second year in succession. Hush off there at the front of the group. Strong man. Very strong bike rider just behind. Behind him, another Scandinavian as well, that's Magnus Baxter. But what a great move and what power for Juan Antonio Fletcher. Well, good for him too. He's 27 years of age now, Fletcher, but he's a good single-day rider. Won a stage of the Tour de France. He was 13th last year in Paris-Roubaix as well as finishing 7th in this race. And it looks like Jan, Jan Kersipu is just hanging on and Jan knows he's got to hold it here. He's not too far off the back, should be good enough to rejoin. He packs the power in the sprint. He got in third place last year. And the two other riders have finished ahead of him or ahead of him on the Kemmel. A little bit of a slip of the gears there by Fletcher. He's put it to rights and he's struggling now, but he's coming up to the summit. Now he's going to have to... He's just looked under his arm there to see if there's anybody coming. He's got a good gap. He's lost none of his lead on the climb whatsoever. As Tor... ...going as well. And Bonin isn't too far down, but further down than I would have thought. Well, I'll tell you one man who's been caught out is Tom Steeles. He's been dropped, but it looked very much there, in fact, as if the big sprinter from Estonia, Jan Kersip, who had recovered a fraction now, the, the tail end of that group is being caught by the front end of the main field. That looks like Robbie Hunter's style there, trying to fight his way up to the summit Could here be. of the Kemmelberg. Zabel looked very comfortable up alongside Tom Steeles, and Stuart O'Grady is in this group. This is going to be a very large group over the summit now of the Kemmelberg. The official time gap, just 17 seconds. Seconds. Well, these boys are still in the hunt here. This race is not decided by the breakaway. They've fought and fought and fought. They've limited the escape of the break, and they've still got it basically under control. Going through them with just an 18-second advantage over the first chase group led by Hushoff is one Antonio Fletcher. And these are quality bike riders here now. They've got rid of the champion of Belgium, but they got rid of him at this point last year, and he got back. And there's every chance he'll come back in the Zabel group again. Bottle goes off the bike of one Antonio Fletcher. Doesn't look like a man to me who's considering regrouping, does he? He's going for it now, and he's going to see what he can get out of this race. And this would be a significant victory for Spain as well, if they could land this, because a Spanish cyclist has never won Gemp Wevelgum. That would be impressive. I really can't believe that a lone man can survive for 36 kilometres. It's a very hard ride down to Wavelgem, although the wind is mainly tail and the gap is not very big, Ouch. so I think he's going to get caught quite quickly. And sat and at the back. Tony Cruz. Excellent. Well done, Tony. This is his big moment here to show the team that he can ride for himself as well as for the others. And he can pack a sprint finish, Tony Cruz can. He could be the next George Hincapi on the podium for the United States. George won it in 2001. These points must be scored on top of the Kemmelberg. A sprint number three won by Fletcher ahead of Hushoft. And Kenchelara up there as well. There you can see that looks like the junction being made there. Two riders from Fasa Bortolo. Now that's Cancellara and Fletcher. Now that is rather interesting to see that formation at the front end. Fletcher looking over his shoulder to see if they've got the gap, but there's a lot more riders scrambling across here. So it's basically a general regrouping. But only a small group, very decisive here. If they're all strong enough to work, we've got about six riders at the moment trying to shape here now against Wavergun. Fletcher has made a good move, and Tor Hushoff looking particularly strong here. He did place three of his teammates up in that initial escape as well. There is um, Baden Cook, and uh, the guy from Lamprey also tagging on the back there. I think that will be one of the reasonable sprinters too, and I'll find his name in a minute when I can remember who was in the breakaway. <laughs> Good regrouping, and in fact, that big acceleration. Daniel there. Benati was the man I was thinking of, Paul. I think that must be him. Benati, yep. And uh, this is into the town of Kemmel. Whoa! Cancellara now uh, accelerating away, looking back to see, and they've got themselves the split. And I wonder if Tom Boonen is going to be the man who has missed out there. One of his teammates has got across to the front end of this bike race. Looks like Maggie Backstead all over his machine there, trying to nail them all back together. And look at the speed here. We're probably approaching 50 kilometres an hour, and I think there was a little bit of motor pacing going on there. 
Well, these boys are inspired now. They know that they want to put the nails in the coffin of the riders they've left behind. I think there's about eight riders in the front group. And the two Fasa Bortolo riders, they lead the team in the Pro Tour competition, by the way. So this will do them no harm at all with a good result today. Even though Pataki, if Boonen had won, would lose his lead in the Pro Tour. There's and this Boonen. is Boonen trying to lead the charge up behind. Just behind him is Jan Kersipu, top sprinter. There's the gap and growing, I think. And that's Lars Mikkelsen, and there, there is Antonio um, Cruz, yes. I nearly T said Fletcher then. Tony Cruz yeah. there in uh, the Discovery Channel jersey, and Jan Kersipu. Now, this is an indication Tom Bonin is going to have a lot of responsibility on his shoulders now. He's the big man with the big reputation who made no bones about the fact that he wanted to win this race uh, to add to his Tour of Flanders victory, and he wanted to be favoured on Sunday for Paris-Roubaix. But now he's going to really have to dig deep. He's going to have to prove that he's a great champion now and take the responsibility of pulling that group back. And they will feel confident with the fact that they've got rid of Boonen and they will feel that 15 seconds might just be enough to take them down to the finish. He must be wondering how on earth he found himself in this chase group, you know, when you think about it, because he's seeming before the Camel had everything under control. But the attacks were well-timed, especially by one Antonio Fletcher. And hats off to him. There's that little gap again. It's still only 16 seconds back to the next group. As the riders continue here, number 195 is Fletcher. Now he's got the team around him. And uh, is that Philippe Pizzato? It is. I think he was in the break all the time. There were some numbers we never got, and that's Pizzato, who uh, many people linked as a favourite for Tour of Flanders. There might have been just four days too soon. This could be his race today. Youngest rider in the Tour de France last year and won a stage. And Cookie is in that leading group. There he is in the uh, fdejeu.com jersey. So this is a very good move by Baden Cook. And it's actually been a couple of years, Phil, since Cookie has really ridden at the top end of the sport. Cop van der Weegstride on the left-hand side, 15 seconds further back the act of Olicus, the chasing group two riders from quick step in the group it looks like Kretchens is up there alongside Tom Boonen and I'm surprised to see in fact that Posato is going through there I would have thought team orders would have been a sit on the back because the top man the cop man is not too far behind no there's eight men has made this move just now as Fletcher now takes a breather at the back and uh, the Lamprey rider there also uh, having a little bit of a breather just now is Daniela Bernati. And he also can uh, pack a sprint finish if uh, it comes his way. This would be a very difficult sprint to judge. And Nico Martin sitting at the back here now. He's also riding well. That little glass of uh, Genova he had at the start <laughs> seems to have done him a world of good. It probably did him quite a bit of good. Um, this is what it looks like going down the slopes of the Kemmelberg. Very scary if you're a bike rider. Around about 65 kilometres an hour, but your eyes are bouncing up and down in your eyeball sockets. And you Horrible. can hardly see a thing. But I think what's interesting, if we go back to the front uh, to see how the bike race is developing, uh, Nico Matin is not a bad man to have in that leading group. A few years ago, mm. he actually finished second when he got away in a situation like this with Frank Vandenbroeke, who's uh, at the moment trying to decide whether or not to continue with his career. Expecting him to turn up at Paris-Roubaix for his first race of the year. Not many riders can say that's their first race of the year. And uh, I would think not a wise decision. But we'll find out on Sunday. We should have an extremely good Paris-Roubaix this year. Very competitive indeed. But this uh, beginning to look a very, very good group out front now. They stretch the gap to 21 seconds. This is the second group here. And uh, they don't look quite as though they've got the enthusiasm they had last time around. This is the psychological section of the course now. Just under 20 miles from the finish. The roads are all flat. This is the lineup. Bone and Kretzens, Kroon uh, from Rabobank, Cruz from Discovery. Breschel is there. Kersey Poo is here as well. Some good sprinters. It's going to be a long, hard ride once they get to the main road in the direction of Wevelgem. 22 seconds is the gap between the first and second groups, and the rest of the race is around about one minute in arrears. Tony Cruz, uh, I don't think, will do too much to the success of this breakaway. He's very much on a defensive role. He's got not got really very much at all to lose. All he can think about is a high position for himself and Team Discovery. They finished seventh with George Hincapi in the Tour of Flanders on Sunday, keeping them pretty high up in the overall classification of the new Pro Tour. But Tom Boonen here, Phil, is under a serious amount of pressure. I'm really not sure how he got caught out. I'm not either. With those teammates, I think he believed himself he had it all sewn up, and that uh, overconfidence can sometimes work against you. And uh, Kretschens, who struggled earlier on at the Kemmel, has now got himself into the front group and uh, Bone left to chase. And they might even 
Uh, if Bonin is going well, they might even tell Kretchens to drop back, but we'll see. Pazzato, Bernati, Hushoft, Matan, Cancellara. Cook and Backstead. Also, oh, uh, Kretschkin isn't in the front group. Sorry, he's in the second group. He's in the second group yeah. with Tom Bowman. Backstead is here. Posato is a man who uh, certainly could create the big surprise here for Quick Step. Uh, Baden Cook is looking a lot more comfortable than I've seen him look for a couple of seasons. It was two years ago that he got himself the win in the green jersey competition at the Tour de France, and since then he's really been battling. In fact, um, despite the fact that he didn't have a great season last year, he won himself uh, 11 races. But a lot of those were really towards the end of the season. From his successes in the early season, three days of Lapana, he didn't do very much at all until the end of the year in the Sun Tour in Australia. That's right. A lot of riders tried to salvage this season by riding in the Sun Tour in Australia. Number 195 is the man who started the move, Fletcher. This is the next group. These are the leaders, rather. The next group uh, just coming into our view now. So that it's, uh, 26 and 53, the two groups are spread. I think we can forget the 53, 26 might have a chance. They might have a chance, but that small group at the front now is working exceptionally well, and it's got some big engines in there, men like Maggie Backstead. Maggie Backstead, let's not forget, has finished second in this race, and from a small group like this, he's got the power to take out the win. Oh, yes. There's the main field, still stretched out in a very long line behind, but this is a moment here, there's a bit of discussion going on, and I think Posato, they're trying to encourage Posato to ride there. Nico Matin is uh, gesticulating in lots of different ways, and uh, Posato has been given the order here, Phil, I think, to uh, sit on and not contribute, so Nico Matin says, well, get out of the way, sit at the back, and let us get on with it. Yes, well, Pizzato, understandably, but he does sprint well. Tor Hushoft also a little bit of a dark horse, really, because he can sprint finish from a group like this and could win. This is Matan. Look at this here. It's, uh, this is what happened a few moments ago. He's having a big discussion there. Well, he's wasting his time, frankly. I think Pizzato was just trying to slow the group down a little bit, but let's not forget he's under orders, and they've got the best man on their squad in the next group on the road. So he's now going to become the psychological sandbag to this leading group of riders, and they'll know that they've got a man just sitting there for the easy ride. Yes, and uh, number 125 there is Jan Kersipu trying to just follow wheels towards the leaders again, I suspect. He missed out on the climb. And these the cavalry behind. This is group number three. And still Rabobank and Uros Moon. And now Stuart O'Grady coming up. Tom Steele's back in this group off to the right of our picture now. Trying to repair the damage. Mm, the skies are staying black, but the rain isn't coming, which is good for the riders. Just and this group is still racing, Paul, you know. It's not over as far as they're concerned. It's not a very big group either that's left here in the, the chase to try and pull it all back together. This is a very strange race game, Wavel Game. It's very often like this. You can have breakaways uh, chasing each other, and then all of a sudden it comes back together just in the outskirts of Wavel Game. That's the leading group there. At around about 25 seconds, you can just see the rest of that group. And I think if the disorganization continues in this leading group, we might see a situation where Tom Boonen does manage to come back. What he has to do now is keep that angry attitude of his, that young attitude, just 24 years of age. And if he's got the attitude of Eddie Merckx, he's got to use it now. He's got to find his legs in the next few kilometres as well because we're running down to the last 15 miles now of the race. All flat. We get to the main road eventually and swing towards town where they're going to pick up a raging tailwind and they're going to fly down that road to the finish. There's Bonin, third wheel at the moment in this group of six, which includes uh, uh, one, uh, Jan Kersipu. And uh, Kersipu isn't one to overwork, but he does like to follow wheels, and he always gets himself in the right position. 26 seconds now. Both groups are closing slightly. Well, that's Tony Cruz in fifth in the line here, but the majority of the work being done by the two quick step riders, they're not really doing anything to that lead though, are they? Because it's still hovering at around about 30 seconds and group number three on the road is actually starting to get them into their sights. And I have a feeling that very shortly they may well just reintegrate this group. And then it's gonna be a big chase, group one and group two on the road. Tom well, Boonham. Sorry, Paul. We've often seen third. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> After you. No, carry on. You're doing well. 
No, I was just thinking that so how often we watch Gent Wherever going when we're seeing these, these wonderful races. When the roads are narrow like this, they're never straight, they twist and they turn. You've really just got to bury yourself to chase down those leaders because you don't see them that often. Uh, they must know that they're holding them uh, because they've not desisted yet at all. This has been a very good race today, very hard for a lot of bike riders, and only the strongest of the day are surviving in that breakaway. And uh, surviving at 27 seconds, a very precarious advantage, 26 now. Well, we've got three groups spread uh, in less than a minute on the road, and you're right, these are unbelievable racing roads, very narrow, difficult to move forward. The race has been in a single long, long line for almost uh, 40 kilometres now as everybody's tried to keep in contact. And everybody actually can see each other in a race like this because we're very much in the open flatlands of Belgium. We've left the Kemmelberg behind. There's not that much forested area here. It's very much farmland, as you can see. And then we're not too far away from the area where old uh, Eric Zabel was jumped on by a horse a little while ago. That's yep. Tom Boonen's group there. It's down to about 300 metres. They're going to get caught shortly. And I wonder if the impetus in the main field will be enough to pull back the leading group. Very often when they catch the second group, that's it. That's when they, they just let the leaders fly away. But we'll see. Uh, Bonin, is that a smile on his face or a grimace? I'm not too sure. Now I think it's a grimace because he suddenly found the responsibility of being the man to beat. And he's getting very little help here. It's tough when you're the big man. You've got the big ticket, the big name on your back. And he was the man with everything to go for here this afternoon. But he's not giving up at all. He's no. certainly putting everything into this to try and uh, pull it all back together. But I think the better part of Valor now would be just to uh, cut the gas a bit, turn in the turbines and wait for that group to come up from behind and then take the risk of that second group on the road, keeping its impetus and catching the main field. He needs to try and recuperate for 20-odd kilometres and then go for the sprint if it comes back together. Well, if you look there, he's looking for help now. He's not getting much help at all there. And uh, slowly, it's going away. 31 seconds now and 40 seconds to the chase behind. They will merge for sure. Here they come. And then that'll be two groups chasing one group and at just 15 miles from the line. 24 kilometres, Hollabaker is where we are. Rabobank trying to get control here of the, of the cavalry at the front because they've got nobody in the breakaway and they certainly had men poised with Heyman and Kroon up there originally. There's the merge, I think. It's not long now. They will get together and then it's going to be quite a considerable bunch here to organise a chase. But the gap over half a minute. Half a minute. The big advantage that leading group has got is they've got two men in the group. They've got Cancellara and they've also got Fletcher. thing is that that chase group are going to be a little bit surprised when they see number one in it, Tom Bonin. They wouldn't have expected that. I they might take a lot of courage from that because uh, they'll suddenly say, hey, this guy isn't superhuman at all. He's back here with us. Uh, then who's left up front? Well, as Tom Steele said, uh, he's just the same as any of other, the other bike riders in the race. He's got a, a strong head and two very powerful legs. Steele's in about 10th position there, and he will be wondering whether or not they've got the ability to keep the impetus going. The one thing they, I'd like to see now is I'd like to see this peloton go straight by this group, <laughs> keep the speed going, and then that's going to make this race uh, pretty exciting all the way down towards the finishing line. I think Holtzman's there was having a word with Boonen to say, look, just save it for Sunday now. This is not going to work. Here comes the, the main peloton. Let them do some chasing if they want to win the race. We'll see how the tactics change now. Certainly, Rabobank are very interested in the result. They need one right now, actually, as they now take control of the chase. The gap is 45 seconds, eight versus the rest. 45 seconds and a lot of riders, a lot of good sprinters in that second group on the road. It's going to be difficult for uh, Davita Monlotto to chase because they've got Nico Mata. But Quickstep haven't lost everything because they've still got Filippo Posato in that leading group. And he's going to get a very easy ride into the headwind for the next four or five kilometres before they then swing around towards Wavelgem and pick up the tailwind. There's the leading group. Baden Cook sitting at the back. Posato sitting in the middle there. And the two riders from Fasa Bortolo are certainly whipping up the pace. That's Cancellara on the front. Maggie Backstead is all over this move. He's not going to let anybody get clear of him. Will be a very interesting sprint there. We've got some good sprinters in this leading group now. Pozzato, Cook. I don't think Fletcher will live with those sprinters. Hushoff can sprint pretty well. Bernardi can. And Nico Matan can. And we know Magna Backstead can. So 
There could be a very, very tight finish here. Who judges the tailwind best and who's put the big gear on for the sprint? That could be crucial now. 44 seconds. They need to get themselves organized pretty rapidly. Here's Mikael Sen. He got caught out in the slopes of the Kemmerberg a, a little while ago. Interesting to see all the pink jerseys of T-Mobile have disappeared off the front end of the peloton. Tony Cruz is uh, in the group there, being picked up. He too got caught out in the, in the flak on the slopes of the Kemmelberg. And it's moving up again. The impetus has gone out for a fraction. They need to get themselves organized because this race is far from over. I just have the feeling that these boys might turn this around, you know. There's still an awful lot of riders want that race to come back. Although the losing ground, as I speak, is out to 50 now. And uh, the breakaway at the front has never been safe whatsoever. Zondvoort is where we are now. Here come the leading eight riders being led by the, um, the boys from Fasa Bortolo. They've got two of them in the breakaway. And uh, service required, I hope it's not service, from uh, Cook here. He might just want a drink. There's the lineup for you. Pizzata, Bernardi, Hushoff, Matan and Cancellara, Fletcher, Cook and Bagstead. Bagstead, second last year, would dearly love to go one better right now. He's the only one left of the top three finishes from last year. Cook is sitting at the back here, yeah, taking on drink. board a drink, but uh, also having a bit of discussion there with the mechanic in that neutral service vehicle. And the fact that his own team car is not up alongside is still an indicator that we haven't yet reached the one-minute mark. Cookie could cause a big surprise here. There's a lot of riders doing big turns on the front, and Cook is actually riding a fairly sensible race here. Just making sure he does enough not to make any enemies in the group. Another man there, Nico Matin, wearing 153. He's too calling up uh, some drinks. That's Paul de Barmarker there, by the way, if uh, you've followed the sport for a long time, uh, driving that neutral service car. He used to be a team manager many years ago. And now he's uh, still keeping in touch with the sport by driving the neutral service vehicle here as the gap hovers at the 53-second mark. Funny style, isn't it, of Nico Matin at the back here. He's a great bike rider. He's in good form. He was hoping to ride well uh, just a couple of days ago in the Tour of Flanders. And um, today I think he was expecting to see the, the race really being dominated by his own teammate, Tom Steeles. Well, there is Nico. He's won 10 races throughout a career, which started back in 1994. He's nearly 34 years of age now. Will be joining the Tour de France. A little squirt for the, for the man in the neutral <laughs> service car. He hasn't lost his sense of humour anyway. He uh, won the prologue to Paris-Nice. That was a great result for him at La in 2003, two years ago now. And he had a great start to the year because he finished fifth in the Tour de Flanders. So he is a very good rider. His best place ever in this event was fifth in 2001. And he might go better this time around. He might just do that. These guys, uh, they keep looking over their shoulders. They're not completely confident. And in fact, if you look uh, just in front of us here now, there's a lot of riders coming in from the bike race. Uh, many men who've taken the shortcut home and probably not done the uh, two loops of the Kemmelberg have decided to call it a day and take uh, an early bath, I would say. Yes, and Rolf Aldog was one of them. There's quite a lot of them coming now. And also, uh, George Hincap, he's just arrived here on the finishing line as well and uh, escorted, as usual, by a number of club cyclists. First time we've seen George here taking an early shower. This is very often his race, as we know from the past. But he missed the break, has decided quite clearly now, Sunday is another day. He'd be looking forward to Sunday. They're still holding it, Phil, at that 50-second margin here, and it looks at the front end of the main field as if we've got a lot of pressure on. Rabobank obviously thinking about the possibility of a win for their man Stefan de Jong who must be locked in this group as well. He got caught out in the crossfires on the Kemmelberg. They've got themselves a big organisation here. Eric Zabel just I think taking a back seat hoping that it all comes back together because you can never count him out when it comes down towards the end and don't count out number 151 either because very canny bike rider. Lovely style. Clearly the style of a sprinter. Tom Steeles and... Uh, he, above all, wished these boys could pick up those eight leaders. It's beginning to look a bit unlikely now, 42 seconds. And uh, Jan Kersipu alongside him, also back in the group now. Two sprinters together as they continue to move forward. Just keep an eye on things now. They're leaving it to Rabobank to do all of the work, and that's going to be curtains if they try to do that. They won't close the gap. And Eric Zabel just sitting at the back as well there, number 218. He's also taking the gamble here. He's probably got his fingers crossed, hoping that it all comes back together because uh, he could certainly be the, the big surprise. There's Kersipu moving forward, keeping himself in a, a position where he doesn't get caught out if the race splits up once again. 
just at the back there, Aurelien Claire of Team Phonak wearing number 72. It's quite a big bunch, really. About 40 riders, a very awkward turn, that one, isn't it? A bit uh, unnerving. These boys are going to go down to the line anyway. They're going to make it home to the finish, 208 kilometres in the legs as it gets darker and darker down in Wavelgum. And the flag's still straight out, so it's still a very good tailwind finish. Still and, uh, threatening. It's nice to see Rabobank putting in a lot of work, but they might be wanting to impress their team management now because they've got nobody in the breakaway, and they know they'll be in the doghouse when they get to the finish today, having not placed a man in the finale. Well, there's the race. You know, there are the eight riders just yep. in front, and it's only 44 seconds. That will give them... Uh, they'll a keep chasing. That'll keep them excited. That'll keep them uh, in the frame of mind to pull it all back together. This is the long road now from uh, Zonnebeck or Ypres, right the way to the outskirts of Wavelgem. But they, in fact, uh, do a little circuit around Wavelgem before they line themselves up for the finish line. These boys from Team Rabobank have got a very good organization on the front, and... They are probably a lot more dedicated to the eight men in front because the eight men in front now will start to find passengers who are trying to miss turns, trying to think about the pot. There's Stefan de Young, number 11. That's why the Rabobank are riding. Yes, and Matt Heyman in the breakaway all day, um, as was indeed Stefan de Young, but they're now back here working very hard. Getting a little help from the one lotto rider there. Wim de Vocht is the rider just coming off the front. The only lotto man putting his back into the chase. And uh, looks like we've got one or two Discovery Channel riders trying to also make an impression. Rabobank come up to offer some advice. Clearly, they've got the orders out here to team time trial this breakaway down. And they're picking up the full strength now of the tailwind. And, well, this could be a very, very interesting finale. They've chipped a second off. It's 39. We're 10 miles from the finish. They're going to do these 10 miles in around about 20 minutes now because they are really flying here in excess of 50 kilometers an hour. That's a chance to see what it looks like. This is at the back end of the main field, a very scary place to be because these guys are all taking risks just to try and stay on the wheel of the rider in front. But you could see this is what the Dutch call the halafawech, or half of the road. They're not worried about everybody else looking for shelter from the wind. All they're doing is creating enough space so that their top man, Stefan de Jong, can get shelter out of the wind from the pacemaking being done by this squad. The Vok comes through now. Team time trial boys now because they're very good at the team time trial, Rabobank. And this year they've, they've got a team time trial as part of the World Cup. And uh, maybe they're practically part of the Pro Tours, they call it now. But there's the split in the peloton. Strong men cross the gap. Weak men go to the back. That's the way it is right now. It is a tough part of the cycle race. And if the gap's open, Zabel there realising at times you've got to do it all yourself. And that's what he's doing. Oh, and my goodness me, dodging on the gutter there. I think it was Jan Kersipoo. Just a bit of desperation there by Kersipu because the split suddenly happened. That's a nasty-looking little rise just ahead as well. A bit of desperation, I would say, was an awful lot of desperation. He will have been throwing out the sandbags just trying to get in contact with the wheel in front of him, and he could see the gap going. These guys have basically been decanted from that group to the back of the race here, and they're going to have a hard time because it is so difficult when you get tailed off in an echelon to actually pick up the pace to pull back what might only be four or five meters gap. Well, I tell you, this is a finale in Ghent Wevelgum. A lot of riders too proud to throw in the towel today. They really believe they can handle this breakaway at 15 kilometers to go, 38 seconds and closing. We'll pull back. We're on little rise here. You'd never know it from the helicopter. It's still a big gap, but it's going to be a desperate finish. And that group is getting smaller. And that group is getting faster as well, and a lot more reinforcements coming up towards the front. We've got a couple of riders moving in there from Lotto. Stuart O'Grady now had a nice, quiet race. O'Grady's just moving to the front. Now it's starting to get that little bit precarious. Lars Mikkelsen from CSC is in there as well. This is a very difficult situation when you've got a team using half of the road in an echelon formation like this because there is absolute chaos at the bottom end of that line. There's Eric Zabel, a little few drops of rain starting to come down, looking over his shoulder. What's the gap? Am I still in contact with the riders at the front? Could be the day for Eric here this afternoon because I've got a gut feeling, Phil, this is all going to come back together. Well, I wonder. 
Eric Zabel flexes the muscles. The clock says four hours, 40 minutes. The riders have been in the saddle. The winning time last year was four hours, 58. They're going to beat that, that's for sure, to the line now by probably two, three, or maybe four minutes. It's been much quicker this year. And these boys have not given up. In fact, looking at those faces, they really believe they can shut this down. And it looks as though the rain is beginning to fall out on the course. It hasn't hit the finishing line yet, which is only, as you can see, 14 kilometres distant. It isn't much. They just need to knock off two seconds for every kilometre of racing between now and the finish, and they'll catch them just inside of the last kilometre of racing. Maggie Baxter knows that very well in the lime green jersey of Licky Gas there. Posato, Bernati, Hushovd, Matin, Cancellara. Fletcher is in there as well as Baden Cook. And, of course, that's Maggie Baxter in the lime green. Cookie must be thinking, just survive, guys. Just let's stay off the front because I can take this one. This has been a desperate breakaway. Even for those who thought it was all stitch up as they approached the Kemmel first time around, it hasn't been the case at all. The peloton has been fired by those coming back from the breakaway, including Tom Bonan. There is Pizzato. I think he's the big dark horse here who could well produce the finish uh, that would stitch it up for the quick step team. He's looking very, very good. The Italian says his form is great. He's had no wins this year yet, uh, but they know his form, and that's all that matters. He is a rider who can win in the sprint. He won the Trofeo Laguelia last year, towards, uh, which was around this time of the year, which means he, he does find early season good condition. But look at that, Paul, 29 seconds. Now they brought it back from nearly a minute coming back slowly but surely the advantage now going towards the main field and roads this are getting is wet psychological moment you see all these guys now are sitting up looking over their shoulders they know that their team cars are not behind they know that the net the gap is not great it's inside 30 seconds now 28 seconds multiply 13 by 2 26 seconds they have to take two seconds a kilometer to pull those men back but the organization was in the main field They've got to lift it a little bit because at 24 kilometres they had 45 seconds, approximately half of what they've got now. But they've got to lift it that little bit more, otherwise they're just going to miss out by three or four seconds at the finish. That's the possibility. But of course, once they know they're getting closer and these roads are going to become treacherous, just enough water on them to make them a little bit glacial. As we look now at the chase group, Rabobank will love these conditions now because they're tough guys from Holland who know how to ride in these conditions with the wind and the rain. And there's help coming now from other members of the squad. People are beginning to sense they can still win Ghent Wavelgum. Well, I think Tom Boonen is probably starting to sense that he could win it as well because he sent one or two of those riders up there in the blue and grey jerseys of Quickstep there. You can see moving up into fourth position, one of his teammates. Boonen himself is back there in the main part of that group. A little bit of disorganization coming into the front end of the peloton, but they've still got the impetus. They've nudged a few more seconds off. It's down to 23 seconds. It really is going to be touch and go, as, a, as you say, Phil. The, the road now is going to be very precarious, and as they get to the outskirts of Wavelgem, there's a lot of tortuous roads are left and right through the industrial part of Wavell game and that's where we can see these guys starting to lose a bit of speed well this is the this is the moment you've got to watch it coming off this roundabout now just enough rain on the top to make it feel a bit slippery as they come off that bend 11 kilometers 22 seconds of gap look at the top of the picture because here come the chasing group now they're going into the roundabout and it looks I think they're going to take the other way around here are they yeah as the Dutch bring them round the other side of the roundabout not so easy to make that sort of a turn, though. The old body, it's not a natural corner for the body. Anyway, off the roundabout, 19 seconds, the gap. Oh, we've lost a second, gone back to 20. But acceleration coming at the front end of the main field. Uh, you can see now a move here. Looks like Bernati's gone off the front there for... With Hushoft. Lampre, that's Hushoft, and trying to get across. It looks as if that's Cancellara just trying to make it number three. 10 kilometers on the right, so remember that's more accurate, I suspect, than our... Oh, well, they agree with us now, so it's 10 kilometers to go. As now they've pulled back, the attacks are starting. They've got to happen now. It's the only way this breakaway will survive. Hushoff's made his move with Bernati back together again. Fletcher's first to reach them, then Pizzato, then Bagstead, and then Matan. They're panicking now. They can feel 
almost the breath of the main field. They might even be able to hear the wheels of the peloton behind. This is the organization on the front. Lots of riders from Rabobank. Help coming from Lotto, also coming from Team CSC. They are riding a lot faster and a lot more consistently. This is going to be touch and go whether those eight riders do survive. But the fact that they're starting to attack each other now, Phil, takes the overall average speed down just a fraction, while these guys will be locked on their normal speed. That looked like Matan going through the haze there the rain coming in onto the lens of the television camera but again <laughs> countered there by Tor Hushoft. Well that was Matty Heyman doing a great work at chasing there's the attack there on the right of the road and the quick counter attack has gone after him he's back in the fold is, Ma is uh, Matin Hushoft second around the corner he's a very good sprinter from a group like this Hushoft and when he's strong he is very strong he was the best placed of all the starters in the pro tour in the Tour of Flanders slipped away after Bone and got the win there because he went Bone and came in into fourth place in that competition. Now they're looking who's going to counter the move. How about this? This looks like Fletcher going again. Nico Matan's had one third place in this event over the years and we go back to 1998. That's when his teammate Frank Vandenbroek at the time got the win. There's another move. It looks as if again uh, it's Matan trying to get himself off the front and it's actually pushed the time gap up a fraction there to 19 seconds. Posato's being caught out there. He's moving all over the road and waiting for somebody else to close down the gap. Now, Nico Matin has risked everything at this point because he knows if he gets caught again, he won't have anything left in the barrel. Well, it's only these counter-attacks and counter-attacks which are going to hold this breakaway off the main field now. 20 seconds is the gap. They've pegged them at 20 seconds because of these attacks. Nine kilometres, a little more than five miles. This was the magic distance on Sunday in the Tour de Flanders when Bonham went, and it was curtains for everybody else at the nine-kilometre point from the finish. Now Bernati looking over his shoulder and thinking, who's going to come and help me chase him down? Here we go, and this is the place where Bonham went, except it was a different course, same country. Nico could be on the ride of his life here, and he's going to do what his countryman did four days ago. Well, he looks good. Look how he's actually struggling there, right on the front end of his saddle, trying to find that little bit of extra pressure. Bernati has seen the danger here, and he's actually already halfway across the gap, but not really, because right on his wheel, you can see the reaction coming from the rest of the group. And they've actually nudged it out a couple more seconds, taking a few risks, going around that corner. The group is onto the wheel of Bernati, and still, you can see... At the front there, Nico Matin has still got that slight advantage coming across. Oh, somebody's gone down. Backstead's gone down. pozato has gone down. That was in the outskirts of the town. You really have to be careful. And that's what we said. We knew this would happen on the run in towards the finish. Well, that's a real shame because they can't survive the chase behind now. Pozzato left sitting in the road. This was when the road got a little bit greasy perhaps here. It happened there. Touch of wheels by the look of it because it was on the straight. But it caught out. Very unusual to see. Um, it may have been on the white of the zebra crossing there but it's caught them out Baxter is up quickly very new to see Baxter fall off his bike and he's riding and he's going to be kicking himself now Eight kilometres to go. Still Nico Matin. Look at his body all over his machine. He's right at the front end of the saddle, trying to get that bit of extra power. Looks over his shoulder, and he still has got the gap. Now, that crash there will have caused a bit of confusion in the group, and in fact it has, because it's reduced it down to just four riders. There's Bernati, Fletcher and Cancellara, and of course Tor Hushoft, who didn't go down at all, but Nico Matin's advantage there, Phil, is only 150 metres. It's really not very much. Well, this road now becoming quite treacherous here because the rain also has reached the finishing line, but it is uh, not, not too wetting at the moment. It's getting very dark. And uh, Matan has thrown all of his eggs into the one basket now. I wonder, taken a leaf from Tom Bonan's book, went at the ninth kilometre, as Bonan did in the Tour of Flanders, survived all of the way to the finish. Strong men survive in a breakaway like this because they are all committed. There's nobody saving something for the finish because of the proximity of the chasing group. Cookie's Desperate. come back. Yeah, Cookie is back and he's going to have to hang on now. Fletcher's wheel. Fletcher will take him into the group here. But uh, bad luck for Magnus Baxter. 24 seconds. They seem to have given up back in the main field because of the infighting in the peloton. But this man is well out of it. And Nico Matan could be riding to the biggest win of his career. He's had a top three in a World Cup race, as they have been in the past, but he's never bettered that. He could be on for the win. Well, he's 
got a long ride to go still six kilometers he's got a six second advantage and looking back you can see the main field is certainly starting to keep themselves winding up and there's this is Ooh. an indication phil of how slippery it is at the back that's kevin holtzman's there well, it must have gone glacial out there because he, oh, he's got a flat back tyre in fairness. He's got no uh, air in the back tyre. So Holtzmans is out of the chase now. The time he gets a wheel, it'll be all over for him. Just a pedal over these last six kilometres. Meanwhile, the select few are chasing and showing no respect for that white paint on the highway, which will be slippier than the black tarmac. Five riders there now trying to get back on Nico Matan. It's going to be a tough call. Matan, nearly 34 years of age and riding to the biggest win of a very long career. He's just holding on, but you know, they're starting to get themselves organized behind. The bad luck that he has is there are two riders in that group from the same team, Fasa Bortolo, and they will combine their efforts at five kilometers to go. He has six seconds. Not much, eh? I don't really believe that he can do it because this group has got the bit between the teeth. Look at that. It's down to just 100 meters. They can see him now. They won't give up. They have got the carrot right in front of them, and looking back, so is the main field. I don't think that's 26 seconds. I'd put it close to the 22nd mark. Desperate moments, but what a great Gent Wavergum this has been now as they go under the five kilometers to go, Banner. These five riders, a minus Magnus Baxted and Filippo Pizzato, are going to pull back Nico Matan with just on three miles to race to the finish. And I wonder now, Tor Hushoft and Baden Cook are going to start feeling they might have this race. Cookie stretching his legs at the back, relying on the chase from the others. Matan will not ease. He's going to make them race up to his back wheel. He is not going to wait for them. He will not give up. He cannot give up now. But in fact, you can see the weakness starting to appear now. It looks again as if it uh, looks like Cancellara is going across the gap. He's got the defense there of his own teammate Fletcher. Fletcher now will respond to any of the counterattacks that happen. And he's halfway across the gap already. He's probably going to be very shortly up alongside Nico Matin. Matin will now have to try and react and see if he can get onto the wheel of that uh, the Swiss Italian. He's got to make an effort because that is. could be the move there. Well, I've said that on every move we've had so far today. <laughs> Paul, this has been such a good race. Uh, but Cancellara now has joined Nico Matan, the man that won the prologue of the Tour de France, along with the man who's won the prologue of Paris-Nice. The two of them are clear now. And there's one man blocking for them back there, one Antonio Fletcher, the man that started the move. Cookie's coming across. He wants the win here this afternoon, and that is a great move by a man who is much more renowned as a sprinter. Bernardi here looks for some help. He won't get any help from Juan Antonio Fletcher, and the man who is really being caught out here is Hushoff, but he too begins his reaction. Halfway across the gap, slowly kneeling his way back is Baden Cook. This is a great ride by Cook. It is a great ride by Cookie, and I think in fact that is Fletcher who has joined Matan. Uh, 193 plays 195 and the numbers are crumpled but I think it's Fletcher who's got across the gap and Cookie is joining them. If Cook joins them they might well sit up because they know he will beat them in the sprint. Well, Nico Matan now getting a bit of help there from the rider from Fasa Bortolo. Cook is across the gap, but the rest of that group is not too far behind. And the main field are certainly not closing it down. They are, in fact, saying it is Fletcher joined by Cook. Left-hand turn, the wind will change. It'll come onto their backs now as they get slowly but surely closer to the finish line. That's the second part of the main group there. Just three riders. This is Nico Matin, Baden Cook. Oh, oh it hurts. must hurt. It must hurt. He's just made the junction there, accelerating out of the go. corner. He mustn't let them go. He's just got to hang on there for a second till the enthusiasm ebbs just for a few moments and get on. This is Hushoff, Bernati, and uh, I've forgotten which one it is now. Cancelara. Cancelara, who is back in that chase group. Fletcher's gone again. Now, that's, that could be it. Now, if anybody deserves to win, of course, it is Fletcher. He started the move, and they all joined him, and he might well be finishing it off. No Spanish rider has ever finished in the first three in the ghent Wevelgum Classic, and this could be the top notch to start with. Well, Matan is still looking down. He's still got the effort here. Second place, still a reality. We can forget the main chase now. In three kilometres, they won't close. They've tried to close for the last 40, and they haven't succeeded. They won't do it now. 
This man is possessed. He wants to be the first Spaniard to try and get himself the victory. He'll be looking up the road. He's probably ridden on these roads over the last couple of days just to see what the finish line looks like. Looks under his elbow there to see if he can see the shadow of anybody else coming forward. Feel a bit sorry for Cookie there. He made the junction just at the right time, or maybe it was the wrong time for him because the next acceleration put him here into third place on the road. And that looks very much as if we're getting slowly but surely closer to the finish. Just three kilometers left to go. What a strange race. One man chased by one man and another single lone rider in third place. Well, that was actually the two kilometer banner as we continue into town with a complete tailwind now. These boys have got nothing left now. It's the gear they can turn. It has been a flat out race. The breakaway has never been assured, never been safe as they race towards the finish now. Juan Antonio Fletcher tried so many times to win a stage of the Tour de France its way last year with his late breakaways and they caught him on the run in at various places. In one town he was beaten by Tom Bonin when he almost survived to the finish. Maybe revenge will be sweet here in Tom Bonin's own country, Belgium. Nico Martin deserved the win but he didn't count on one Antonio Fletcher. It is three riders here now, one on one, fighting towards the finish and it is desperate moments because behind, if anything happens, they'll be swept aside by the three riders chasing in. Gone last year's runner-up is Magnus Baxter, taken out by the crash. 1,000 metres to go. This is the face of the second-place rider, knowing that a sprinter who can beat him is riding on his wheel. We're into the finish. Into the finish. What a great ride by this man, Fletcher. Just again looking under his shoulder there to see if he can see the shadow of anybody else. Nico Martin, I have to say, Phil, has put in a sterling performance. He's the man who started this move inside of the last 10 kilometres. He was hoping he was going to get the win, and he's still not given up at all. He's almost got the Spaniard right in his sights. This is a battle. This is the old mano a mano, man against man. I think a little bit of help coming from Nico Martin from the neutral service vehicle there, and I think round the front of those cars, he'll probably find uh, Fab, uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher. Well, desperate moments here, because we're not got the first Spanish winner yet. Martin has dug something out of the pot here at 300 metres, 250 metres, over the top goes Matan. Unbelievable, what a victory for Nico Matan. His first ever classic of any description. How on earth he found the strength, driven on by the fact he is a Belgian, by the fact Lotto were desperate for the win, and by the fact that he's just beaten what would have been a first ever Spanish victory. You have to feel sorry for Juan Antonio Fletcher. And third place, it looks like Bernati. No, that'll be fourth because, oh, yeah, he's third because... Uh, is that Cookie has been passed on the running? So he has. So that was third for Bernardi of Italy. And Tom Steeles brings the rest home right on the back wheel. Well, it's a long time, Paul, since we've seen a result like that. Unbelievable comeback that I thought he was never going to see the Spanish rider again. Freddie Mertens in there, the former two-time world champion. And, of course, the record holder for stage victories at the, the Vuelta a España. And, of course, let's not forget he's won this race as well in the past. But what an incredible comeback for Nico Martin. Phil, that was a, that was well, a move you, like I've never seen before. Well, quite clearly the advice is have a glass of Genevieve before you start. <laughs> it's a Belgian gin, by the way. He was joking when he drank it on the start line this morning. Well, look at that. He's come home with an absolutely inspired finish. Well, when, you, when you're in that sort of a mood, you're never going to lose, are you? Because this man was determined to do it. That, by my reckoning, is the 11th win of a very long career for Nico Martin. He turned professional back in 1994. He stopped, in fact, at the start of the 1999 season when Cofidis uh, did a medical on him when he joined the team and they found he was suffering from a heart problem. He was later cleared. He came back and today he has won his biggest ever bike race in Ghent Wavelgum. Whatever we say about Nico, we feel desperately sorry for one Antonio Fletcher. He made the race today. I thought he'd done enough to win it. I thought he'd done enough to win. I don't think he expected anybody to come back like Nico Martin, but Martin never gave up until the last 50 metres. He battled, even when he'd been caught and passed, he went right the way in. Suitcase of courage job that one, wasn't it, Phil? It was indeed, and the, the motto is you never, ever give up, because that is unbelievable. He's nearly 34 years of age now. He's had a third and he's had a fourth in the past, and now he has got the final big win. Um, what a way to go out at the end of your career. <laughs> You've you've had to wait a long time for this big victory. Yeah, it was already third in uh, 98. I was fifth in uh, 2001. 
when Henke P went, so it's one of my um, greatest races I went in my career. So um, I went the pond, I went the prologue of Paris Nice, but for me to win Gun Wevelgem, it's it's my training circuit. I pass every day in Wevelgem. Sometimes on the training, I put my hands in the air. I thought I win, so I think it's the most beautiful moment in my life. I think. How is it possible when at the end of the race Fletcher went away? You never gave up. You always believed that you could come back and win yeah, this race. The moment Baden Cook he came back, I wait five seconds and then Fletcher he go. I say what the fuck he go and I say I can keep him. So I try to 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 stay 50 meters, but I I know I was strong enough to. to but I know the the finish. I pass every day. I say I can. When I saw the last kilometer, I say I can beat them. I can beat them. So I beat them. <laughs> Pretty tough day in the saddle, but what a way to come out for the team. Well, I talked with Nico last night and he said, yeah, yeah, I want to get on the podium tomorrow. I have to beat Boonen. And I uh, didn't, to tell you the truth, I didn't really believe him, but uh, he's come out swinging today and smashed everyone, obviously. So You won't have seen the finish there. He actually was dropped by Fletcher with about four kilometres to go. He never gave up. He caught Fletcher in the last 200 metres and found an incredible sprint to go and get the win. It was an incredible comeback. Well, he trains on these roads here and he knows this, this race back to front and uh, you can just tell his character, he's a, he's a real dog, you know, he's got, you can't back him in in the corner and uh, watch out, but he's an incredibly strong guy and uh, he's been very consistent and he's been saying he's the strongest for the longest time now, but today he was. The nice thing is though, we also saw a very strong Hank Vogels who was part of that victory. Yeah, I haven't had too much racing leading up to Ghent Wervingham, but I made the, the front group, but dropped on the camel, just not enough race experience, so it's a good warm-up for Sunday. Good luck. Thanks, mate. That's a nice win. So there's the result confirmed. Nico Martin of Belgium wins his first big classic, and that's what it is here in Belgium. Juan Antonio Fletcher becomes the first Spanish rider to podium in this event in its history. And Daniela Bernati, he got the third place because poor old Baden Cook got swept away to sixth there in what turned out to be a rather entertaining last 500 metres of this year's Gent Wavelgum. Tom Steele to, took the sprint from the main field. What would he have done had he had the legs to stay with that group over the second climb of the Kemmelberg? Truly an amazing event there. And I did notice that Juan Antonio Fletcher immediately congratulated with a warm hug um, the winner of the race, fully appreciating the effort he put in there uh, to win this year's Gent Wavelgum. Nico Matan, 33 and three quarter years of age, and he gets the biggest win of his career in uh, a season which started for him the first time back in 1994. There's the desperate finish from the pack here, uh, being led out from uh, Buchart, but then when it came down to it, oh sorry, this is the main field coming in here, which is uh, quite a long way down. Just on seven minutes for them as they cross the line. And the rain happily never really developing, but it did affect the finish as far as Magnus Baxter and Filippo Pizzato was concerned. So the Belgians are certainly celebrating a great spring here in Belgium, winner of both the Tour de Flanders and now the Ghent Wavergum Classic. But Nico Martin, people are saying he came up behind those cars to snatch victory. And certainly the manager of the Fasa Bortolo team, Giancarlo Ferretti, he's put in a complaint and says that this event shouldn't actually be part of the Pro Tour if that's the way the referees are going to conduct themselves. Whatever we may think, the fact is, Paul, those cars should not have been there. No, they shouldn't have been. At the final, final of a race like that, they should have been kept nice and sterile mm -hmm. so that the cars and the motorbikes couldn't get involved in the race. Don't take anything away from Nico Martin. He just used animal instincts in the last kilometre of racing. All he wanted to do was win. And let's remember, too, that Fletcher was the very first person to congratulate Martin. He later said he was absolutely dying in that last 350 metres to the line. Well, the racing season goes on, of course. Next up, it'll be Paris-Roubaix. That's where we'll be. And we'll see you there. For Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Liggett saying goodbye. <laughs>